For those of you not familiar with CSAFE, it is the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence. The center is funded by NIST and housed at Iowa State University and is a collaboration of Iowa State, Carnegie Mellon, the University of California, Irvine, and the University of Virginia. <coughs> Our moderator for this panel is Alicia Caraquiri, and Alicia is a distinguished professor of statistics at Iowa State, where she received her doctorate. She's a past president of the International Society for Bayesian Analysis. She's a member of the International Statistical Institute, a fellow of the American Statistical Association, and the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. She's, uh, she was elected to the National Academy of Medicine and has served on several National Academy of Sciences committees and is a co-director of CSAFE. And I will invite Alicia to introduce you to the panelists. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having us. It's really uh, great to have the chance to talk to you guys about what we're doing at CSAFE. Um, CSAFE and other places. Uh, so the rest of the panelists are uh, Professor Karen Kafferer. Uh, she is a professor of, um, I don't remember your chair now, but she's a, a professor of statistics and chair of the Department of Statistics at University of Virginia in Charlottesville uh, and a co-director of CSAFE. Uh, Amy Crawford is sitting in the middle. Uh, she is a doctoral student uh, in statistics at Iowa State University. And uh, for her research, she's working on um, handprint analysis. Uh, Henry Swafford uh, from the Defense Forensic Science Center. Uh, we collaborate with DFSC. Um, Henry is the author of uh, FR Stats. And he'll talk about FR Stats today. Uh, so uh, he'll talk about fingerprint uh, analysis. And finally, uh, but not lastly, uh, shall we tie? Uh, Xiaoyi is a doctoral student in statistics at Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, she's working on several things related to forensics, uh, bridge face analysis, um, uh, dark web finding accounts, and, and identifying uh, sellers of uh, uh, forbidden things in the dark web and several other things. So um, without much further ado. So what we want to do with this session is mostly uh, talk about the new technologies for the uh, analysis and interpretation of forensic evidence. Uh, we have five different topics here. I'll talk about bullets. Uh, Karen is going to talk about glass. Uh, Amy, as I said, will discuss handprint uh, analysis, uh, writing. Uh, Henry will talk about fingerprints. And shall we is going to talk about? Bridge phases? Yeah, okay, phases. bridge phase analysis. <laughs> I didn't know which one was the topic. So like um, Matt said, we are a center of excellence, a NIST center of excellence. Uh, we are a consortium of four universities, and um, there's uh, four co-directors of CSAFE. Uh, as I, in addition to Karen and I, there's Hal Stern from the University of California, Irvine, and um, and Bill Eddy from, um, from Carnegie Mellon University. So what I'll talk to you today is the uh, evaluation of bullets. So ballistics, uh, or normally uh, known as ballistics, um, it's pretty subjective as I'll discuss, but I will um, talk about efforts to come up with a semi-automated and objective approach to comparing bullets. So there was, uh, everybody knows about the 2009 National Research Council uh, report that uh, was very critical of most forensic disciplines with uh, exception uh, being DNA. Um, the, the claims was that uh, much of the other uh, forensic uh, tools really lack scientific, sometimes lack scientific validity uh, if they do have scientific validity, they haven't been properly tested um, in sufficient data. That's still a problem in the area of forensics. And of course, there's a problem that sometimes uh, forensic scientists have um, 
overstated the significance of a match. Um, so um, one of the topics that I will talk about uh, today is uh, the last bullet here, the issue that um, sometimes uh, forensic scientists, jurors, lawyers, the general public uh, equate incorrectly uh, this issue of indistinguishability from uh, same source. The fact that two things may not be distinguishable does not mean they have a common source. And there's many examples, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, the, one, of the ish, one, of the, one of the things that has perhaps contributed to this uh, incorrect uh, equation is the fact that uh, forensic scientists these days have a lot of good technology at their fingertips. Um, in some areas like toxicology and, for example, uh, analysis of trace elements, and I'm sure Karen's going to talk about this more, um, there's some pretty fancy lab instruments uh, that actually do result in very precise measurements. So there's nothing wrong with the measurements that forensic scientists get, for example, when you're talking about the concentration of elemental, uh, you know, of elements in glass, for example. Those measurements are pretty good and are very well taken. What is not correct, then, is to say that uh, because two fragments of glass have pretty similar chemical composition, they came from the same pane, pane of broken glass. That simply does not follow. And uh, there's two, well, and the other example, of course, is a defunct practice of uh, comparing uh, bullets using the chemical composition of the bullet lead. You, you, you guys may remember about that. Uh, the fact that uh, two bullets had um, very similar elemental composition in the lead alloy in no way indicated that they came from the same box. Uh, they may have come from the same um, uh, batch of molten lead, but so did another 300,000 bullets. So, so that uh, did not, um, uh, did not, it didn't follow that uh, you could trace uh, two bullets to the same box. Uh, in some other areas, like most pattern areas, however, um, we're still at the point where we're not even getting measurements. Uh, so all of these technology advances have not uh, result, have not uh, seeped into the uh, practice of forensics uh, everywhere. Uh, ballistics is a very good case in point. Uh, in this, uh, ballistic firearms examiners to this day um, compare the pattern of striations on two bullets, maybe one found at the crime scene and one uh, a test uh, shot from some putative gun, let's say. Um, they used a comparison microscope to do this, uh, to, to decide whether these bullets are similar enough or not. And there is absolutely no measurement of any kind involved in this type of analysis. Um, this is what they do, essentially. So here you have two specimens, uh, and you can see the striations, and some of the striations are cut across that red line. So one bullet is on one side, the other bullet is on the other side. So this is a very subjective uh, evaluation uh, to this day. So um, ballistics is, uh, is one of those areas where both, I think, technology and science uh, have been largely absent, at least until now. Um, the FT theory of identification on which firearms examiners rely to uh, come up with an assessment of a match or non-match is really circular and confusing. I mean, this, it says that um, agreement is significant when it exceeds the best agreement demonstrated between two marks uh, known to have been produced by different tools and consistent with agreement demonstrated by tool marks known to have been produced by the same tool. If you're a scientist, you read this and you really want to weep. Um, <laughs> th this is really, really uh, not a good um, theory of any kind. It goes on to say, um, statement that sufficient agreement exists between two tool marks means that the likelihood another tool could have made the mark is so remote as to be considered a practical impossibility. Uh, so this is um, the after theory of identification is, um, I think, has done a tremendous disservice to firearms examiners and to the 
and to the practice of uh, tool mark examination. There's a, there's, if you read what this says, is there's several implications. One of them is that striations are unique and persistent, meaning that each gun leaves unique marks on uh, the bullets it fires. And another one is that um, the same gun will leave the exact same type of striations uh, every time you fire it, regardless of how many times you do so. The second, the persistence uh, assumption is demonstrably false. In fact, there is, um, uh, we have not yet, uh, um, we have not, there's very little data on consecutive uh, firings of guns. There's one data set that's on the NIST uh, website. And if you look at that data set and look at uh, correlations between bullets fired consecutively, you will find that um, after a certain amount of time, those correlations go down and down and down. So it gets, uh, if, two, if two shots are sufficiently separated, um, it may be the case that you cannot, um, that you cannot declare them to be uh, unique. We have a study going at Iowa State uh, where we have fired 15 uh, pristine, um, pristine guns, uh, what were they? Six hours, six hours P320, uh, consecutively manufactured. We got lucky because the Story County Sheriff's Office was renewing all their uh, fire, uh, firearms, and they let us use those for an experiment before. We have fired each one of those uh, 15 guns 2,000 times, and uh, we're going to be looking at persistence. Uh, we still uh, have not, um, I still don't have results to show. The question of whether striations are unique, in other words, whether a gun leaves uh, unique marks on ammunition, is probably true, but it certainly hasn't been demonstrated. What I can say about this is that uh, in this last couple of years that we have been looking at guns and bullets, we have not yet found two guns that leave the same bullet, the same striations on the same type of ammunition, that doesn't say that, um, that we won't, but at, for now we haven't. Um, so, in my expert opinion, this is uh, another practice. Uh, so forensic practitioners often resort to subjective assessments, and this is of course uh, very prevalent in firearms examinations. Uh, in my 40 years as, uh, uh, of experience as a fiber examiner, I have never seen two items that are this similar, or I have compared thousands of bullets and I have never made a mistake. Well, the fact that you haven't been called on it doesn't mean you haven't made a mistake. And uh, experience is no substitute for well-designed experiments where we actually know ground truth. You see, in court, we don't know ground truth. So we cannot really challenge an examiner that says, trust me, this is the same gun. Um, so one of the things that we do at CSAFE is um, collect data sets, construct data sets for which ground truth is known so that we can actually test these as, this assertions in a scientifically uh, valid way. All right, so let me get to bullet striations. Uh, I hope that you guys haven't seen, well, some of you may have seen the inside of uh, the barrel of a gun. Here we have uh, the barrel of a gun, and you see these this, uh, grooves. Uh, this is what's called the rifling of the barrel. Uh, this is uh, made by design. Different uh, brands of guns have different uh, number of uh, grooves and uh, in different direction, perhaps. Uh, but regardless, uh, these grooves, um, when the bullet travels down the barrel, these grooves are done so that the aim is better, so that, the, so that, the, so that the, um, the, the, the bullet in flight has a more predictable uh, direction. And so what happens is that when the bullet travels down the barrel, uh, you end up with um, uh, marks. Um, and uh, so these are the groove impressions, these things that are, this is looking at the cross section of a bullet. These are the groove impressions, and between the groove impressions you have the land impressions. The striations appear on the land impressions. And so when people say, I'm comparing two bullets, what they're doing is they're looking at the striations on the land impressions. In this case, I think I have 
uh, six lands, there's different types of guns that have more or fewer guns. This is called um, conventional rifling. Uh, there's another type of rifling uh, that's used by uh, um, Glock and other manufacturers, but not too many, which is called polygonal rifling. And in polygonal rifling, there's hardly any grooves, and so the, the, the inside of the barrel is smooth. And if I was a criminal, I, uh, that's the gun I would buy. I would buy a Glock. <laughs> because there is no way to, it, it's very, very, very difficult to look at a Glock, either by a firearm examiner, uh, by, you know, by the eye method, or by a computer and uh, locate where the striations are. All right. So what is the art of ballistics? Well, the art of ballistics is um, uh, firearms examiners attempt to uh, answer the question of whether two bullets could have been fired um, from a specific, a bullet could have been fired from a specific gun. This is when you find a suspect and the suspect was stupid enough to keep the gun. Um, uh, so that's what we might call identification, try to identify the gun that uh, shot that bullet. And then, of course, there's a question of common source. So you have a bullet in this particular crime scene, and then there's another crime that's committed, and you find another bullet, and you compare those two bullets, and you ask yourself, could have been the same person involved in both of these crimes? So that would be the common source. We don't have the gun, but uh, we ask ourselves whether the same gun may have been used um, may have been used. So I've already talked about the fact that this is very, very subjective uh, for the time being. Um, this is kind of uh, tongue in cheek. I know how much when I see one, but that's essentially what the after theory of identification says. And the problem is that, of course, there's no accepted universal thresholds that uh, allow you to say, you know, I exceeded this threshold, therefore I can declare these two things to be indistinguishable. Uh, and there's certainly no estimates of error rates of any kinds. So the firearms examiner will, the, the, the only time, so the firearms examiner will say exclusion, identification, or inconclusive, and inconclusive is the only sort of a, uh, uh, well, inconclusive is when there's not enough information, really. All right, so uh, it is not, fair to say that there's never been an attempt at objectivity because there has been. Many, many, many years ago, somebody called Nichols um, tried to come up with something with a method that was called consecutively matching stria. I don't know if you guys have run into that. And so Nichols uh, said, what you really need to do is put these two things together, find the best agreement area, and then count how many consecutively matching stria you have. And there was, uh, there was a threshold, I don't remember what it was. And um, the problem is that uh, consecutively matching stria are not very discriminatory. So this is, uh, to, to come up, let me show you, let me tell you what we have in those pictures. And, so on. and this is the Hamby data set, the famous Hamby data set, uh, 10 consecutively uh, manufactured barrels, 15 shots for each barrel. And so what we did is we looked at every possible pair. Some of those pairs were known to, uh, some of those pairs of bullets came from the same gun, we knew were from the same uh, gun. Some of them were from different guns. So the blue bars denote, so for example here, when you have one consecutively matching stria, yeah, 100% of those pairs that had one consecutively matching stria uh, were pairs that were known to be fired by uh, different guns. On the other extreme, if you had 22 matching stria, then 100% of those pairs uh, were pairs known to have been fired by the same gun. But in the middle, uh, for example, if you had nine matching stria, about half of those pairs came from the same gun, and about half of those pairs came from different guns. And so it's great if you find a lot of matching stria or very few matching stria, but if you're here in the middle, you really have no idea. Um, so what's our, uh, so what do we want to do? So what we want to do is come up with some comparison criterion that is objective, is defensible, uh, is scientifically valid. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. I'll show you a lot of pictures. Um, and so we want to develop the score, a score, let's say, that quantifies the similarity between two bullets. 
But we also want to understand what the behavior of that score is when uh, we compute the score for pairs of bullets that are known to have been fired by the same gun and pairs of bullets that are known to have been fired by different guns. And the data we use is uh, surface topology of the guns. So we have confocal three-dimensional microscopes. Uh, the FBI has those, NIST has those. Um, I'm not sure that I know of any other state or uh, lab that has, well, the FSC, of course, has these, right? Probably. <laughs> uh, I don't know of any other uh, lab that has this, but this is a technology that's coming. So uh, it, I, I predict that in four or five years, this is going to be the best practice. Anyway, so this is the facility at Iowa State. This is the famous confocal microscope. It's hooked to a computer. And this is the type of image you get. So you can see this is one land of a bullet. I'm looking at it from the top. Um, here would be the top of the bullet. Here's the bottom of the bullet. This is the heel of the bullet. And the reason we focus on an area that's close to the heel of the bullet is that that's where the marks are expressed the best. Uh, you can see there's all kinds of uh, funny things uh, on the top, and the striations begin to degenerate uh, as you get to the uh, top of the bullet. We look for the ideal area, and typically it's an area that's close to the heel of the bullet. By we, I mean the computer. We don't do any of this stuff by hand. If you look at this land from the side, right, so bullets are round, so this is one land impression. There's some curvature to it. Uh, here's one of those grooves. Here's the beginning of the other groove, as you can see. And you can see that there's a lot of noise uh, here. So this, the bottom figure is uh, the most stylized version of this uh, cross-section of a land. Here is one groove. Here is another groove. Um, the first steps in the algorithm that we have developed is to find the groups. Turns out to be very difficult to do automatically, um, believe it or not. In some cases, you don't have grooves. In some cases, one groove is more pronounced than the other. So this turned out to be a hard problem that I think we have solved. And so what we do is we chop off anything that's outside these blue lines from the image before we analyze it. Um, the next step is to what we call extract a signature. And so here you have the same figure that I showed you before, this figure over here, except that I have overlaid a smooth curve. This is a statistical model, uh, and it's the curve that best fits that land. And once I subtract the blue curve from the original curve, what I get is this thing. These are the deviations of the surface of the bullet from that smooth curve. In statistical terms, we would call that a, a set of residuals. And this is the length of the land, right? And these are, here's the value zero. And so you get some dips, some peaks, and et cetera, et cetera, that correspond to the striations. Now we are talking. Because now we have something that we can work with. Uh, here I'm showing you two signatures, so this is for one land in one bullet. This is from a different land in a different bullet. And what we do then is to compare them, we do some horizontal shifts to find the best alignment. And at the bottom here, you see those two signatures aligned. And of course you ask yourself, and they're pretty similar but not identical. And you ask yourself, are these uh, similar enough for me to declare that these two bullets were fired from the same gun? Now the statistics starts, right? So I need to extract information from those uh, overlaid signatures. There's a lot of information that I can extract. I can extract, for example, how many peaks coincide. I can extract, uh, I can count how many valleys coincide. I can look at the area uh, between the two signatures and compute that area. I can look at the average height of peaks in both, or the average depth of bodies. There's many number, there's a lot of things I can compute. And so we call those features, and uh, we look at the number of matches and mismatches in peaks and valleys. We look at the number of consecutive matches and mismatches. This is sort of along the lines of consecutively matching striat. We look at the differences in depth of peaks and valleys, and so on and so forth. And of course, we add the cross-correlation function. 
So um, ideally, what we want to do is um, well, we want to develop, we want to combine all that information and develop a score uh, that has high sensitivity and high specificity. And so for the Hamby data set, and by the way, the Hamby data set is a toy data set, but it's, it's useful to develop things. So for the Hamby data set, uh, this is what, so again, I have the, the light curves, the light blue curves represent um, known matches. In other words, pairs of bullets that were fired from the same gun and the dark blue curves represent known non-matches. So for example, if I look at consecutively matching striae, which is the first uh, square here, the distribution of consecutively matching striae uh, shows higher values among mates than among non-mates. So this is the distribution of the, blue, of the dark blue. Uh, if I look at uh, the consecutively non-matching striae, this is the next one, as you would expect, there's more consecutively non-matching striae among the non-mates than among the mates, and so on and so forth. But the other thing that you notice is that all of these distributions have a lot of overlap. So none of these uh, features on their own is discriminating enough to tell us, to, for us to be comfortable to say, for example, oh, if I have a uh, more than 10 consecutively matching stria, less than 10 consecutively matching stria, and I can declare this to be an unmatched. That's not true because there's a lot of probability among the matches uh, for uh, non consecutively for consecutively matching stria. So what we do is we combine all those features using something called a random forest. A random forest is just a collection of decision trees. It's very it's. It's, um, I, I'm not going to explain decision trees right now, but uh, um, if you trust me. Uh, this is called a supervised learning algorithm. And it turns out that when you combine all the features uh, into a single score in an intelligent manner, you get a score that is perfectly discriminating. So we found, for example, that we could tell apart all of the known non-matches from all of the known matches. So the scores for the known matches were about 0.6 and higher. The scores for the known known matches were about 0.2 and lower. So this is fabulous, but the question is, does this hold if I go to a different data set? One problem with this type of algorithms is that they tend to predict poorly once you take them to a different data set. So we work with several police departments around the country. One of them is the Phoenix uh, Police Department. And they had this one study, and they sent us their uh, uh, bullets. This was a study where there were eight guns, and uh, three test shots were fired from each gun, and 10 question bullets. And this was an open set in that some of the bullets uh, may not have been fired from any of the eight guns, and some of the guns may not have fired any of the 10 question bullets. So we didn't know what was what. And so we used the model that we developed using the Hamby data to see whether we could classify that. And lo and behold, we made no mistakes. So here you have uh, barrel A9, barrel C8, barrel F, uh, F6, and so on and so forth. Barrel U, so what you, and then test, three test shots, each one of those columns is a test shot. And so we found, for example, that bullet N was fired from barrel A9. And we knew that because the scores that we got from the three test shots were about 0.75 in each case. And for all of the other bullets, we got scores that were around 0.2 or below. And we knew, for example, that bullets Y and Z were not fired from any of the test guns because all of those scores were below 0.2 or 0.25. And we also knew that barrel U10 hadn't fired any of the test fires because again, we didn't find any score higher than um, 0.25 or something. We have tested this algorithm with thousands of bullets um, where we know ground truth. And so far, we haven't made a single classification error. That's a little worrisome, but, uh, but it seems to be working amazingly well. It, the algorithm went belly up when we tried it on Glocks. So this is what I'm saying. So this is something that's extraordinarily promising. We have had, we reached out to firearms examiners around the country. They have come to visit us at Iowa State. We have spent days with them, sitting at the Confocal microscope, collecting data. They brought their samples. 
Uh, they try the algorithm, they love it. And so we will continue working on that. So this is very nice, and I have only a couple more slides, but the problem is that even though we know we can match two bullets, we still don't know what uh, the weight of that evidence is. So if I am willing to assume that each gun leaves unique marks, then I'm done. But if I don't know that, uh, then um, I need to figure out what the scores mean. So uh, the next thing we did is we, or the next thing we're doing is trying to estimate the distribution of the scores under two competing hypotheses, the hypothesis of same source, hypothesis of different source. And this is a work in progress because in order to come up with these distributions that can be used by anybody as a reference distribution of scores, you have to assemble an enormously large database of pairs of bullets known to have been fired by the same gun and an even larger database of pairs of bullets that were known to be fired from a different gun and the way you define different, of course, is very important here. Um, and so this is what you get for, ignore the top, let's look at the bottom plot. Uh, but that's not true when you change ammunition type, when you change gun type, when you change all kinds of other things. Whoops. <laughs> all right. Um, and so this is, as I said, a work in progress, let me skip that, that we need to um, follow. Tomorrow we'll talk about uh, this issue of score-based likelihood ratios. So I'll skip that last, uh, that last slide. Um, we, um, we're pretty confident that we're going somewhere with this algorithm. I think we probably have something that can be launched within the next few years. Uh, the acceptance among firearms examiners has been tremendous. And the only reason uh, we don't go all out is that we still don't have enough data. But that's coming. And we still need to, as I say, collect uh, much more data. We need to validate our methods. We need to write user-friendly software. The software is not very user-friendly at this moment. And we need to continue engaging practitioners and transferring knowledge. So thank you so much. Uh, that's my email. Hypothesis about what might happen if you tested your algorithm on handheld tools, the other sort of pattern yeah. that people in AFD do? Yes, uh, like screwdrivers, you mean? Yeah, the screwdrivers. Yes, uh, we're working with the uh, Virginia uh, Department of Forensic Sciences on exactly that. So I still don't have I still don't have results, but we're looking at um, so uh, hacks. What do you call them? So hacks. Hacksaws. <laughs> Sorry, hacksaws, and looking at the um, and, and looking at the striations there, and we also have a set from the Ames lab on um, uh, screwdrivers. Uh, we still don't have results to sh to share, but probably pretty close. Yeah. Just one question on, on not finding uh, uh, any two uniqueness. The question. I'm assuming that that's based on your 3D technology. And yes. Not and have you like, had an opportunity to look at some that were kind of close and eyeball them and feel like, you know, and ask the examiner whether or not they would have mistaken that? That's a very good question. And we have not yet done that, but we are in the process of. So we're working with the Houston Forensic Science Center. And um, they, have, they have a study that they're launching pretty soon where they're sending test uh, sets to firearms examiners and asking them to classify them. We've already imaged them, and we've already tested them. We made no mistakes on that set. So as soon as the firearms examiners come up with their assessment, we should be able to look at that. Yeah, that's ongoing too. There's one here, one there, yeah? I do have uh, a bunch of questions for you, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. And just because I'm a firearms examiner, so maybe after I can ask you, but one question I do have for you, when you make a statement that the uniqueness and persistence of striding marks hasn't been demonstrated. I mean, 1970, Monty and Lutz, they started doing these empirical studies of consecutive manufactured firearms. Yeah. And there's been numerous studies since. I mean, I've taken part in numerous studies. Consecutive manufactured firearms, uh, striding marks, but we're able to identify and to differentiate which bullet came from which barrel. So I guess my one question would be, are, 
are you not aware of, I, I guess, those yeah, empirical yeah. studies yeah. that are out there? But then if you are, I just don't understand the statement that this hasn't been demonstrated. <laughs> well, it hasn't been proven. And I, mind you, I said, I had a caveat, right? I said, it's hard to prove. But we have not found uh, uh, two guns that leave the same marks either. So yes, there's been a bunch, some studies, uh, typically very small, um, that have looked at this issue. And in those particular studies, uh, they haven't found two guns that leave uh, similar marks. But you know, if you put together all the guns that have been included in those studies, you get what, maybe a thousand? There's a 10 Hamby, and there's a 15 the other one, and so on and so forth. So generously, there's about a thousand guns that have been tested in the way you talk about. No, that's incorrect. There's, if you look at Andy's study, um, there's thousands, not just from farms in all over the world, but you're talking, we're going to You said study replicated back. from the same set. So there's, so the Hamby study, the original Hamby study had 10 guns that were uh, consecutively manufactured, the barrels were consecutively manufactured. Then those sets were replicated. So it's not that there were new guns. The test fires were replicated. We at Iowa State have about five of those replicated sets. But I think if you just go back to what you said about proving something, we're not proving anything. Um, we're just saying that we, we can differentiate, you know, these stride marks. We're not out to prove anything. Um, but I guess that statement that you said, that this has not been demonstrated. This uniqueness has not been demonstrated. In general, it has been demonstrated for a few guns. You're right, but it hasn't been demonstrated no, it's in general. Correct, but you can't, a few okay, guns. shall we continue this later? Oh, I would love to. All right. <laughs> uh, there was another question. Well, I was just going to ask about the Baldwin study. Do you uh, yes. have an opinion as to the uh, false positive rate of firearms examiners right. as a result of the Baldwin A study? Yes, uh, so David Baldwin, that was the old study, right, where they showed a very, very low positive, false positive rate, right? Like 0.1% or something like that? Yes. I am not tremendously familiar with that study. Uh, I, you know, if you had to ask me, I would probably say that it was a reasonably conducted study. Um, I think one of the issues was um, that was not on bullets, that was on breach faces. Um, so, it's probably okay. I mean, I, I, I really don't have an opinion on that one. Um, I, I, we have those samples now in our possession, and we're trying to image those same samples using 3D technology. NIST will also image those samples once we're done with them, and see whether we can go back and compare to what the examiners and that, that was based on the ground truth, right? That was based on ground truth. And it included about, it was, there was a large study. There were about 22,000, uh, there were about 30 guns. I mean, it was still a small study in terms of guns. It was about 35 guns. Uh, uh, but each one was fired very many times, yeah. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> All right. What would be your scope about, like, when is it not the number? When is what? Oh. When is the, do you have any idea of, what is the point of view, like, how many guns you have to test to say the number? That's a really hard question, too. So one of the questions is, um, that we don't know, and nobody knows, is, um, what affects the striations that a gun leaves, right? So, for example, do I have to have separate databases for each model of gun in combination with each type of ammunition. Uh, so the factors that affect the way the gun leaves the markings, aside from the class characteristics, of course, are largely unknown. And so I don't know, for example, if I can compare the striations from a specific gun with two different brands of ammunition. Is that fair or not? Or uh, so. So to answer that question, we first need to know in how many subpopulations we have to divide the combinations of guns and ammunition. And if it's few, 
then, um, then we're in good shape because we get a bunch of uh, shots from those combinations. If it's a lot, then we're in bad shape because we have to get lots of shots from each one of those gun and bullet type, uh, ammunition type of uh, combination. So we don't know yet. I think if I can add one statement there, there's been, in, in the pattern evidence domains, there's been a fingerprints, footwear, tire tracks, firearms, and so forth. There's been a number of studies over several decades demonstrating the discriminating capability of these evidence types. Um, so there's a lot of support that these evidence, the evidence is discriminating between one source to another source. The problem is, is that, and I include myself in this as a practitioner community, is that when we go to court, we make a statement that this evidence sample came from this specific gun. And that's a very, very, very strong statement. So if we back off a little bit on, that, on the strength of that statement, and we say there's a lot of evidence supporting the discriminating capabilities of this evidence, and I was unable to differentiate those, that is valuable for the courtroom uh, during litigation. But we need, it's very difficult to prove uniqueness, and that's the issue. The longer we want to prove uniqueness, um, the harder and harder and harder we're going to find that it's going to be. Yeah. Can I prove uniqueness? Well, I, and I agree with you, and, but I, from myself, our perspective as a practitioner, we're not out to prove anything. And just like you said, I think you do have that caveat, you know, this bullet came from, was made by this source, um, you know, based on this, but you, you're correct that you do have that caveat that, and we never stay to the exclusion of all of the firearms. That's something that went away years ago. That's but not I true. Agree. You don't. But there's a lot of your colleagues that do it. I, yeah. No. How to, I mean, I, I'm in a trial right now where the testimony, and I'll show it to you, is to the exclusion of every gun in the universe. You should not, I, I agree, you should not be saying that. Exactly. Yeah, that's what you, you've got the right mindset. <laughs> there, there are a lot of people that have said that, and that's the issue. We, we're at a point of evolution in the practitioner community, so you're on the right side of that fence. Yes. So just keep going the way you're yeah. doing it in that way. Right. Uh, I, I think everyone agrees uh, with you, Alicia, that um, the conclusions in the report and the testimony are really the problem as much or more than the data sets. Uncertainty is just something that happens. And even in answer to this gentleman's question, 100,000 guns fired and tested, if we had enough resources to do that, would still have an uncertainty associated with oh, yes, it. So it's, it's just asymptotic. Yeah. The question is, how do you interpret the data with the studies that have been done and the appropriate way to answer these questions? And I'd like to call on Henry to to give an answer for this group of how fingerprints has become really the poster child for saying, okay, we did black box studies, we know what the fall terror rates are, even PCAST accepted it. We don't report fingerprint matches anymore the way they were done before the NES report. And the way the standards call for conclusions in the reports and testimony that's now given by reputable uh, fingerprint examiners is an example of what could be done in other pattern disciplines that would satisfy the observation that you made, the case that Alicia is talking about, and other pattern groups in addition to fingerprints. So maybe you could share very briefly how fingerprint examiners address and solve that issue. Sure, I'll share it in, in the elevator speech and then I'll talk more about it when we present in the interest of time align our testimony with what the evidence supports, with what the data and the research supports. The research does not support that we can individualize an evidence sample to the exclusion of all others. Right. So what we've done in the, within the Defense Department is we said we're no longer going to testify like that. And boy did it appeal half the community. <laughs> but we said we're going to back it off a little bit and we're going to say we have associated these two evidence samples together on the basis that we cannot discriminate them. And then all we have to do is point to all of this other research that's out there that shows is that fingerprint evidence is highly discriminating. And that really put us in the clear. Then the jury and the attorneys can look at that and, and they can make the decision of whether they think it did or did not come from this particular source based on the circumstantial evidence. But that put us in the clear on a lot of this issue. We just made sure that we aligned our testimony with what the evidence or the data out there supports. Question? 
sort of um, I, um, idealistically believe that we can help uh, strengthen the forensic science system and, and help it move forward. That was uh, the intentional title of the 2009 report. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, statisticians, we love data, and there's an aspect of trying to draw inferences from data, and uh, that's where I think a statistician's um, uh, expertise lies. And I really want to credit um, people like Henry Swafford, who appreciate um, that when he was running into an inference problem with statistics and he reached out to statisticians. Um, so uh, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're very, um, tr you know, trying to help as much as we can. Um, Alicia mentioned quickly the bullet lead situation. I'm going to review that briefly because it's quite related, I think, in many respects to glass. How many people know about the bullet lead, lead situation? The report came out in 2004, terrific. Okay, so I'm gonna go through it kind of quickly, but the idea was that a crime was committed, there was evidence, and there were some bullets, and if the gun is recovered, as Alicia just mentioned, um, then you tried to match the striations on the bullet and the gun barrel. That was actually a separate NRC committee on which Alicia served. Um, but when there was no gun recovered, then they would try to match the chemical concentrations of, the, um, of certain elements, seven elements, uh, used um, in the bullet that was found in at the crime scene with that that might have been found with the potential suspect. And the idea was that somehow if those concentrations matched, then that was an uh, indication of guilt. So the local police department would send both the crime scene and the potential suspect bullets to the FBI lab, and then they would measure them in triplicate seven elements, and then report as analytically indistinguishable concentrations between those two bullets if what they did is they calculated the mean plus or minus two standard deviations overlapped for all seven elements. Um, so uh, the FBI was quite confident about this procedure and the SCNRC to form an NAS committee, and they had basically four questions. Uh, the analytical procedure was sim simply fine, and the uh, choice of elements seemed to be all right. Uh, there's always this aspect of, you know, are they seven independent features, or are they somehow related to one another? So you can imagine if you're trying to take measurements on a person, well, you could take length of left arm, length of right arm, length of left leg, length of right leg, length of left foot, length of right foot, and circumference of the head. Now, you can imagine things like the arms are really highly correlated, and probably your arms are kind of correlated with the length of your legs and with the length of your feet. So it's not really seven truly independent features. Um, and so you have to be careful to, to take that into account. They also asked about the statistical tests, and they were asking about um, you know, mo known variations in the manufacturing process. And then finally th was the interpretation, the probative value. And basically, I think there the question they were asking was, is it okay to say that the bullets came from the same box? So uh, here were some data from uh, one of the bullets from federal manufacturing, uh, antimony, copper, silver, bismuth, uh, um, silver, and tin. Uh, sorry, arsenic and tin, and there were the three measurements. There were the mean and standard deviations, and then we took a second bullet, and then here's a, dis a display on the left-hand side that showed the plus or minus two standard deviation intervals in black for bullet one, 
and those for uh, bullet two, and you can see as you go down the six elements, there are only six elements in this study, um, that they all overlap, and so the testimony would be they were analytically indistinguishable. Now there was a problem about the boxes. So this was cartridge cascade incorporated uh, manufacturing. Here were the 50 bullets uh, in box two in black and the 50 bullets in box four in red. And what you see are pairwise plots between four sets of elements, antimony, copper, uh, bismuth, and silver. And the upper diagonal is just the flip of the lower diagonal. So it's the same picture, it's just the mirror in image. But you'll see there are an awful lot of bullets where you couldn't tell if it came from the red box or the black box. And then moreover, you can also see that there are a number of uh, situations here where you, know, you, you might uh, see uh, bullets that are just completely different from that great big cluster. So unfortunately, the, pr the procedure was not good for either inclusion or exclusion. If the concentrations were very similar, you didn't know if they came from the same box. They might have come from different boxes. But moreover, it wasn't good for exclusion either because if the bullet concentrations didn't match, it didn't mean that they, did, they, uh, did, that they came from, they did not come from the same box. So uh, the FBI, however, had calculated the error rate by comparing all 1.6 million pairs of bullets in um, what they called the 1837 bullet database and quoting from their um, information about this uh, set of bullets, they selected, these bullets were selected from each combination of bullet caliber style and nominal alloy class. In other words, they were trying to get as many different kinds of bullets as possible in this data set. Well, it's kind of surprising they found any matches. They were supposed to be different. But amazingly, they did find 693 matches and therefore concluded that the uh, error rate in their procedure was only 0.02%. But when we did simulations, we found it was actually bigger than 0.02%. So the statisticians on that committee said comparing pairs of obviously different bullets would not be a proper way of doing it. Uh, the assertion that bullets came from the same box was not sensible. We actually went to a bullet manu uh, cartridge manufacturer and we could see you know, how you could get different bullets um, from different batches in the same box. Um, it's not questionable, it's questionable how probative it was and the historical data also suggests that the elements were correlated, so it was useful for neither inclusion nor exclusion. But a proper assessment of the error rate, and I could have hugged the um, Sergeant uh, Caldwell earlier today, he said, you know, we don't just throw out the dog into a real world situation, we test it first in situations where we know the answer. And so that's what we try to do with statistical validity is we say, okay, suppose the um, bullet concentrations really differ by 10% or 20% or 30% or 40%, how likely is it that the, the FBI 2SD overlap test would say they're analytically indistinguishable? And at the other end, if the bullet concentrations were differed by only say 5% or 2% or 1%, how likely is it that they would come back and say that they were analytically indistinguishable? So the first one would be a false positive. The second one would be a false negative. We don't want false negatives either because then the, you know, car, the guy goes out and, and commits more crimes. So what we did in that case is we actually used the data to simulate. Suppose we had two bullets. This one con is different by X percent from this one, uh, those concentrations, and we actually counted the proportion of the simulations where it passed the, uh, the test. So on the left was, um, this plot actually appeared in the report, and on the left was um, with one element, so concentrate on the one on the right, but roughly what the one on the right is showing is 10% different, 20% different, 30% different, and you can see that um, with that, look at that solid line, um, I'm not discussing the dotted line, but with the solid line, it did suggest if the bullets were as much as 30% different, you might be uh, inclined to say with probability about 9% that they actually were analytically indistinguishable. So the NRC uh, report was released, and uh, in September, we actually didn't tell the FBI to stop this procedure. We simply pointed out the, um, the, the issues with it, and um, a very smart director at the time um, understood the issues and then decided to um, uh, uh, drop the um, procedure. So uh, as Alicia mentioned, 2009, there was the report from, the, um, again, National Academy of Sciences about uh, various kinds of evidence. There were several recommendations, one of which was to form National Institute of Forensic Science, which of course didn't happen, but there were nine others, including the establishment of st 
standard uh, technology for reports and testimony, and studies of accuracy, reliability, and validity were needed. The government response was to have um, the NIJ take the lead on this National Commission of Forensic Science that met for three years, and then uh, the Attorney General disbanded it. Um, and then uh, for NIST to take the lead on the Organization of Scientific Area Committees, uh, uh, fondly known as OSAC, and the director, Mark Stoller, always here. The, um, post, uh, the uh, goal there is to post standards for um, good forensic practice on their registry. So there's a picture of the OSAC uh, organization, and so at the top you see there's the Forensic Science Standards Board on which yours truly serves. And then there's some resource committees, but then there are the scientific area committees. And so on the far right, you see physics and pattern, um, evident, pattern interpretation. Hal Stern, whom you'll meet tomorrow, is on that committee. And below that is Friction Ridge, and Henry Swafford is the chair of that one. And then uh, uh, to, in the um, second column, you see there's a chemistry uh, committee, and you'll see a few lines down below that is materials and trace. And Alicia served on that one, and that's really what we're talking about here is uh, trace elements. So the reason I talked about bullet lead is because there are a lot of similarities between that and uh, these glass standards that were proposed by the American Society for Testing and Materials. And uh, three of these have been proposed for the OSAC registry, two of which have been approved. So uh, the only way in which these standards differ uh, for, for the most part is in the technology that they use to measure the concentrations. And measurements always have variability. If you measure your height, you know, you might get a slightly different answer than if you measured it tomorrow or uh, the next day or somebody else measured it. So somebody knows the true answer. You know, recording Angel knows your true height, but you have a measurement and you're going to hope that measurement is pretty darn close to the, what the recording Angel has written down her little book. So the differences among these three standards is really just in the technology that is used to measure the concentrations. Um, uh, the first one is, uses microwave X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, fondly known as EXRF. Second one uses ICPMS, and the third one uses laser ablation ICPMS. First one and the third one have already been approved for the OSAC registry. All three of those standards provide a method for determining trace element concentrations, a list of elements, and a calculation interpretation of results. And that's where statisticians can come in because we do have some experience in knowing how to interpret data. Um, so that's just a, an example of one of the sections from one of the standards, but they all look the same. They say, you know, here are the, um, uh, the elements that you should be measuring. And again, I want to point out that it's important to try to determine from a statistician's point of view and also from a practitioner's point of view, which of these elements are actually highly correlated, because if they're highly correlated, they're not giving us additional information, right? Um, it's not that that's bad, it's just, you know, you, you don't think that you have 17 independent features here. Uh, for example, it's well known that um, in uh, glass, it turns out that hafnium and zirconium are extremely highly correlated, and lo and behold, our chemist on the FSSB pointed out to me that they are in the same place in the periodic table. Um, so uh, all of them have the same um, concept about calculation interpretation of results. And basically, you remember with bullet lead, where they uh, calculate mean plus or minus two standard deviations for all of the concentrations in bullet one, bullet two, and then they look to see if they overlap. Here, what they do instead is they take the fragment that is known. I say, you know, uh, uh, we notice, uh, uh, Ms. Karakiri, that you have some glass fragments on your jacket here, so we're going to measure those concentrations, and they'll calculate those means plus or minus four standard deviations. Then they go to the crime scene and they measure those uh, concentrations and calculate the means only, and they see if those means fall into this plus or minus four standard deviations. Okay, so uh, uh, mathematically, actually, they're similar, except that with Alicia, we calculate standard deviations. With the recovered fragments, we didn't calculate any standard deviations. Okay, um, so that's what these two pages say. And um, for ICPMS, those are the elements there. And for LAICPMS, they uh, delete samarium and they add in three others. Okay, but that's what the 
that's what it says. And again, just as we did with bolt lead, we want to know false positives and false negatives. So if those two uh, recovered fragments actually came from the same source, what's the probability the procedure will claim that they were analytically distinguishable, but also a false positive, what they actually came from different sources. In other words, what if the concentrations were actually really different, okay? More different than you would see in just sort of typical manufacturing variations within a pane of glass. What's the probability that the procedure comes back and says, no, I cannot stay, say that they're analytically uh, distinguishable. So as I say, most studies, uh, in fact, uh, all, most, uh, almost all the studies that we've seen estimate error rates in this way. They collect a wide variety of samples, okay? Again, trying to cover the whole space of, of glass samples. So they'll get, you know, cars, uh, baby jars, uh, wine bottles, beer bottles, et cetera, different countries, different manufacturers, you know, Fords, Audis, et cetera. And they collect several fragments from the same sample or pane of glass and measure each fragment. Sometimes they'll do that, okay? Sometimes they'll collect several fragments from the same sample. Then they'll apply the match procedure to all possible pairs of samples and count the number of times two different samples matched and the number of times the two same samples failed to match. And for the most part, when they're looking at uh, different samples, they find very low error rates. Well, again, not a big surprise. If you compare an Audi with a Honda, your uh, windshield, you probably will get different answers. So uh, the collection is intended to be diverse, but just as we did with um, bolt lead and as you do in any kind of validation study, you say to yourself, what if I'm the recording angel? I know the true difference in the concentrations. I know it's exactly 20% or 30% or 40%. What's the probability that my procedure will claim uh, not analytically distinguishable? So if the concentrations are really close, we're going to hope that the probability that they say they're analytically indistinguishable is really high, okay? But if the, con if the differences are really large, then we would hope that the, that uh, probability is small. So uh, that's what we did is um, we used available data. Uh, I'm going to concentrate mostly on just LAICPMS because that's the one for which we have the most data. Uh, XRF, um, according to our uh, uh, expert glass person on the uh, Forensic Science Standards Board. He said there is no publicly available data that I, that I know of, and since he's the authority, he would know. So um, I'm not going to discuss that one, but I will talk about the data sets that I have. A uh, very nice people, um, fellow in Germany who shared with me his data set that was published in 2011, and then a wonderful gentleman in Canada who uh, shared with me his data. Um, and uh, recognize there is sources of variability. Again, as I say, if you measure the same thing again, you'll get some variation. You hope that's small. But there's also time variation. If you measured it two weeks from now or a month from now, you might get a different answer. There's fragment variability. If you took different fragments from the same pane, you might get different answers. We hope that the biggest source of variability is fragments from this pane versus fragments from that pane, so that those are highly distinguishable. So um, we're trying to get away from depend, having the error rates depend on the specific data set that you used. And so what we're going to do is do just what we did in bolt lead, simulate um, uh, the uh, concentrations. And there you have to know just how correlated are the elements, OK? Um, so these two pages uh, are, have all the details, and uh, it's pretty explicit so that in the privacy of your own home, you can then uh, repeat this procedure on your own. Um, but we did have three estimates of the correlation matrix from the German data set that I mentioned, the Canadian data set, and then recently, um, Alicia Carey Curry had her team take some uh, LAICPMS uh, data, and she kindly shared, us, shared it with us before publication. And um, I want to point out that the correlations among some of the elements are quite large. What I'm going to show you in the next page is a, a display of those correlation matrices from those three different uh, places, Germany, Canada, and the ISU one. If elements were completely uncorrelated, we had 17 real independent features in front of us, then what the picture should look like is it will be red on the diagonal, indicating the highest correlation because elements are obviously correlated with themselves, but anywhere off that uh, diagonal, it should be white, indicating zero correlation. What you're going to see is that the pictures don't look like that. In other words, there's a lot of correlation. 
So you see there are a lot of places here where it's red showing that those elements are highly correlated with each other. And all three of them, of course, the diagonal is red because all elements are correlated with themselves. But they certainly are very different. That's the other message is that different labs uh, are showing different degrees of correlation among the 17 elements. So uh, the results from the, um, the modeling, um, I'm, uh, I want to mention one other thing about the modeling. So a lot of people like to believe in um, uh, the bell-shaped curve, right? You know, everyone believes in that nice, normal bell-shaped curve. What I've shown you here is a bunch of curves. Um, it's the black one at the, at the bottom on the tails, and it's at the top in the middle. Um, that indicates sort of how probable uh, you would get data in those regions. And what's shown, the other six curves are just slight deviations from the normal distribution. <clears throat> Looks awfully slight. I mean, you know, golly, it seems like, well, they're both kind of symmetric. They're both actually symmetric, and, you know, they both look pretty similar. But the reason I show that is because when we actually simulated the data, we simulated assuming it was your nice, pretty, idealistic uh, bell-shaped curve, but we also simulated from situations where it might not be so idealistic. The frank truth is with three measurements, you will never, ever be able to tell which distribution it is coming from. So it's important to consider all possibilities. Uh, this is what the false positive probabilities look like, and on the x-axis, you see point two indicating 20% difference between the concentrations uh, in each of those 17 elements, 40%, 60%, 80%. Um, and the lines indicate from the Canadian data set and the German data set, the black line was your nice, pretty uh, a utopian bell-shaped curve, and the other lines were for two other distributions that I showed you, which looked on the picture like they're awfully similar, but they have big uh, effects on the error rates. So. Um, False positive rates are probably much higher than this um, claimed 0.1%. A lot of the data sets that we saw, they had only onesies, twosies in terms of the number of bullets that were, um, uh, that, they, that they indicated. As I say, the only data sets that we found which had a lot of measurements on them were the Canadian one, the German one, and we uh, were able to get hold of the Alicia one only um, at the 11th hour, so I have fewer results on that. The um, variation, there's variation fragments from the same paint. This 4SD test may suggest that fragments whose concentrations differ by as much as 50% are in fact not analytically distinguishable. I think there's a bit of concern over the use of the term analytically distinguishable because um, if uh, uh, an examiner is sitting there and the prosecutor says, so were they analytically distinguishable? And he says, no, I could not find that they were analytically. So does that mean they're analytically indistinguishable? So, um, you know, maybe jurors, some jurors are really smart and they'll understand that ju that just means it came from a batch where the concentrations were similar. My fear is that a juror will interpret that as being that they came from the same source. Um, there is more to come. Uh, there is an ASTM standard currently before the OSAC registry for approval. The same concept, uh, concept uh, of using um, this uh, forensic, in this case it's uh, uh, infrared spectroscopy is a valuable method for identification and comparison of pressure sensitive tapes. Uh, section 8.6 is highly specific. It says spectra are dissimilar if they contain one or more meaningful differences. Uh, and spectra cannot be distinguished if they contain no meaningful differences. So um, I think uh, terms like that do need to be more quantified. I do believe that sound statistical methods are needed to assess the reliability and inference of procedures in these standards so that hopefully we can um, improve them. So the first paper, Dorn, and the last paper, Weiss, those were the um, Canadian and uh, German um, data sets respectively. Uh, the uh, Trejos at all data sets, those are the ones that seem to have just onesies, twosies in terms of bullets. Um, and uh, the third one there was the um, NRC report from Bullet Lead. And the fourth one has, is a longer, uh, detailed version of the talk that, I, uh, that I've just given today on glass. So can I take any questions at this point? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> okay. I, I did try to move along here because I'm kind of running out of time. Yes, Mark. 
Um, Karen, this isn't a question, but I wanted to, to point out the fact that you have made an investment um, in OSAC as the statistical guru that has um, given you perhaps the feeling that you're serving as the forensic dentist telling everyone they have a 99% probability of a major cavity. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, ignoring the cavity is not the solution. And I think that the evolution with CSAFE, uh, the entire panel that's sitting there today, um, that's been supported with $20 million of NIST money, is evidence that statistics count. And your um, tenure with the OSAC is ending this fall. And uh, it, it your request, not mine. And um, I just wanted publicly to thank you for the contribution in bringing our attention to the fact that uncertainty in front of Thank you for your earlier remark about there's uncertainty in everything. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move along because we are running late. Okay. Thank you. I um, am a graduate student at Iowa State University studying statistics um, under Dr. Carefree here. Um, my research is a little bit in its earlier stages, so we're trying to do something similar with handwriting um, than, as we're doing with the bullet. So I'm kind of in the feature extraction stages, so um, the, the end of my talk will kind of hit on that. But, uh, but the beginning of my talk and the bulk of my talk is kind of just about handwriting in general, kind of the, the direction we want to take our project, our handwriting project at CSAFE at Iowa State University. Um, and some of, the, some of the technologies that are already out there, um, what gaps they might leave in, in, the, in the field, um, and, and how we plan to fill those gaps. So it's a little bit less technical of a talk, um, but, but I just want to show you kind of where we're going with, with our research here. Um, so this work is funded with CSAFE and NIST. Um, NIST funds CSAFE, CSAFE funds me. Um, right, so um, uh, question documents, right, are, are um, used at, you know, they come up as forensic evidence, ransom notes, suicide notes, forged signatures, wills, all these things. Um, question documents themselves often refer to um, burn documents, you know, the toner used in the printer, uh, the ink, um, the handwriting, the signatures, all these different things, you know, are part of a question document examiner's workday. Um, I'm focusing only on handwriting, but I just wanted to make the point that forensic document examiners don't just work with handwriting, right? So they do a lot of other things, but their training in handwriting um, is, is to notice the subtleties, right? Um, they're trained on, on how to look for curvature and slant and, and, and wispy line endings and beginnings and, and how to notice tracings and forgeries and all of these things, and, and it kind of becomes second nature for them. You know, they just kind of see it. Um, we work closely with a forensic document examiner at the Division of Criminal Investigation in Iowa, um, and so he, you know, he's able to kind of explain his process. And, and we we like working really closely with the with the examiner because you know we don't want to miss something. We don't want to we don't want to be off base when we develop these systems because we're developing them for examiners. So so I just wanted to point that out when we move forward. So. I'm going to start off with a case study. So the Peter Weinberger kidnapping happened in New York, in Long Island, in 1956. And so I just want to make the point that forensic handwriting examination has been used in civil and criminal cases since the late 1800s. I mean, as long as people have been writing things down, people have been trying to trick others, you know, by writing things down. You know, this is, oh, when wills were written, this isn't, this, this is the real one, you know. Here it is, you know, I'm the beneficiary, here we go. Um, and so, and so this has been around for a really long time. Um, and so, so here's the case study. So Peter Weinberger on July 4th in 1956 was taken from his patio. Mom went inside to do things. Baby was outside on the patio. Um, and, and he was taken. A ransom note was left behind. Uh, the parents are panicking. They ask for a media blackout. Unfortunately, one of the newspapers um, at the time prints the story. And so the ransom note had instructions on where the parents were to go to you know, leave the money, pick up the baby. Uh, the kidnapper never showed up. The, the first drop site was swarmed with reporters because that newspaper had printed that first story. So July 10th, now notice, now this is six days later, 
Uh, the kidnapper in these six days has called the Weinberger house twice with, with additional instructions. Neither of those pan out. You know, they follow the instructions. They just want their baby Peter back. Um, and so the kidnapper didn't show up at either location. None of this pans out. But at the second location, um, from the second phone call, uh, another handwritten note is left in a blue bag. Um, and, and it's telling the parents where they can find their baby, you know, leave the money here. So there's this whole rigmarole. Um, but with that second handwritten note, experts are able to determine, you know, determine that these notes were likely written by the same person. They were likely authored by the same writer. So, uh, so that was a big step in the case. And this, at this point, is really the only evidence that they have. This, these are the only leads that they're kind of working with. July 11th, the FBI gets involved. Uh, the FBI at this time had a, a seven-day waiting period um, for, uh, for kidnapping cases. This is one of the cases that kind of drove that down to the 24-hour waiting period. Um, but this is, so this is the end of that seven days. I mean, your baby's gone for seven days. The FBI can finally get involved. Um, special agents get a crash course on handwriting analysis. And so they deploy these special agents, and they're combing through you know, DMV records and school records and, and all these, um, these records where you would fill out documents by hand. And they examined and eliminated almost 2 million handwritten records, um, these, these special agents who got their crash course in handwriting. Finally, on August 22nd, so this is over a month later, um, an officer and one of these special agents notices similarities between the ransom note um, and writing in a probation file for um, Angelo Lamarca. Uh, Lamarca, they, they did some investigating, had many unpaid bills, owed some money to some really dangerous people. Um, these were the two documents. So the, this, the one on the left is the first ransom note from the Weinberger kidnapping left on the porch. The document on the right here is going to be the probation file. It's the known writing of Angelo Lamarca. Um, and so these are the similarities. So you can imagine when these special agents were trained to go out and you know, look for similar handwriting in, in these almost 2 million files, um, they, were, they were told, OK, look for slant. Look for curvature. Like, look for this, right? This A and this A here. There's some A's here. You can look for the same curvature. Um, I always like to point out the E. Where's the, so there's one here, right? And then this guy over here, or girl, right? It doesn't matter. Um, and so these special agents are trained to look for these things, and, and they, find, they find this similarity, and they bring it back to the trained examiners, the document examiners, and they say, yeah, yeah, we think that this is a match. Um, and so they arrest Angelo Marca. He confessed to everything. The sad truth is that he left the baby on the side of the highway when reporters had swarmed the first drop site, uh, so Peter had, well, did not make it. Um, but he owed some money to some really dangerous people and really, really wanted that money. So he's trying to keep stringing these people along. But this, is, this, is, these, this was the evidence. This is what got this guy. You know, he went to jail. Um, and, and so we'll come back to this case study after a while. But, but this, is, you know, this is something that it took over a month to comb these documents. And so this is something that systematic approaches, computerized systems can really help. I mean, this is the 50s. But this is kind of where we're going with things. Um, and so um, handwriting, like all, a lot of other um, evidence types and analysis, is, has this foundational assumption, kind of this, this driving principle. Um, and that's that individuality principle, right? So um, for handwriting, as we learn how to write, right, we're in copy books, we're tracing things. When your focus shifts from the letters that you're writing on the paper to the content that you're writing, the sentences, the sentence structure, the paragraphs, the paper that you have to write for class, or whatever it is, that's when your individualizing characteristics start to creep in. Okay, so these class characteristics come from copy books. They come from your instructor, your teacher. Um, but your individualizing characteristics start to show up as writing becomes second nature to you. Okay? Um, and so back in 1910, um, Osborne, in his book, wrote that given sufficient quantity and quality of writing, no two writers have the same set of individualizing characteristics. Right? Given sufficient quantity and quality. But... Um, but this is a big statement, right? And so there have been studies um, that have been try done to try and demonstrate this principle. And so what you want to do, just like with the consecutively rifled guns or the consecutively manufactured um, 
uh, bullets and all these things, right? You want to take homogeneous groups, homogeneous subgroups of the population you're working with, and you want to see if you can if you can tell them apart. Because if you can tell them apart, you know, then then you're then you're uh, you're in the game. So. Um, so identical twin studies have, have been done. Um, classmates, there was a really neat study that had classmates from a Catholic school. Um, they, had, they had gone to school together. They had like the same three nuns teach them how to write or something um, all through Catholic school. And they were kind of all in the same area still. Some were spread out. But, but there's a study done where they all wrote, and, and those were all indistinguishable. There were clear class characteristics that were showing up in their writing. Uh, but their, their subclass, their individualizing characteristics really told, uh, you know, uh, separated them out. Um, so identical twin studies, um, those have all been able to be um, identified as well. So there have been studies to, to demonstrate this principle, but this is that one that, you know, can it be proven? Can it not be proven? We need lots of data. Fortunately for handwriting, that data is cheap, right? It's cheap to get a pen and write on some paper. It's cheap to, you know, if I was doing data collection, I could be like, hey guys, for the last five minutes of my talk, can you all just write this paragraph down? Thanks. You know, um, write with the proper, um, consent forms and all that jazz, but right, but it's cheap. Um, it's, it's, it's cheap to, to get that data, to use a scanner, to scan that data in and to use it, right? Okay, so like Karen was talking about, the variability in the glass, right, what you really want is the, this window pane to be really different from this other window pane. So it's the same with writing. Our intra-writer variability is the natural variation for one person's writing. You don't write the same line to line, day to day, you look at the A you wrote five minutes ago, you look at the A you wrote in the word that you just wrote down now, they're different, okay? So this handwriting is hard. Handwriting is a complex motor skill. Um, it's human generated and then it's human evaluated, okay? So there's lots and lots of, of room for error here. Um, what we want, our jackpot here, right, is the inter-writer variability. We want writers to write really differently so that we can tell them apart. Okay, so this is what provides us with evidence to support our source propositions. So the FBI document examiners follow a four-step process, right, these human examiners. Um, first, they do an independent examination of the documents. They look for characteristics. They've been trained to do that. Then they do side-by-side -side comparison. This is all done from a neutral standpoint. Uh, then the evaluation comes in. And so this is the part where it's based on the examiner's training, knowledge, and experience. Okay. But this is the part that's the subjective part. Um, and this is the part where we're trying to come in with some statistics and give some numerical evaluation rather than an expert opinion evaluation and support those document examiners and what they're doing. And then um, for the FBI lab, as far as I know, they verify all of their cases with, a, with a, um, another examiner. Um, they communicate their expert opinions, um, their conclusions using a verbal skill. Um, the the SWIG doc, um, the scientific working group for forensic document examination, develops standards and guidelines. They still cite those 1910 Osborne, the Osborne book, the 1920 Huber and, Huber and Hedrick um, documents. These these citations are all from you know way back when. So this has kind of been a really long standing standing thing. Um, uh, just like with bullets, you know, there's no quantity required to establish a match, right? There's not a threshold number of stria that we need for bullets to establish a match, just like there's not a threshold number of A's that you need to look similar, right? Or B's or whatever it is for handwriting to establish a match. So we want to bring some qu uh, quantities in, some numbers, all right, as statisticians. And so there's this movement from the 2009 NRC report, from the um, these other reports that have been mentioned earlier, um, to introduce these statistical procedures and computerized systems into um, and build the statistical and scientific foundations kind of in the field. So in my opinion here, there are two approaches to viewing handwriting as data, right? You take the evidence, you need to quantify it in some way, okay? And so approach number one is document examiner driven. So the examiners are going to determine the characteristics that will be part of the statistical analysis. Okay, so my example here is Cedar Fox. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of this one. It was developed at the Center of Excellence um, for Document Analysis and Recognition, so that's Cedar, um, at the University of Buffalo. Um, so a document is processed, partitioned, right? We can't work with whole words. People don't write, you know, um, giraffe in every document that they write. We just want to look at their letters, small meaningful pieces. Um, and so macro features are automatically extracted from, from the document, slant, you know, spacing, things like that. Um, that's data, right? That's quantified. Um, 
An examiner then, through this interface, determines which microfeatures or which, which characteristics are going to be used in analysis, right? This, so this is going to be more data. So um, there, these, these features then are turned into zeros and ones based on a number of rules. So um, it's a little complicated. I left it out. But essentially, you take these strings of zeros and ones for each letter and you compare them to each other. You find out how far apart in Euclidean space is this vector of zeros and ones. Okay, so that's part, that goes into the statistical analysis. Um, this is based on likelihood, um, log likelihood, and so these log likelihoods are, are, are added together, um, and at the end you get this, this opinion box, right, calibrated score, opinion, given that the documents compared are from a full page with different content, and then there's this nine point scale. Okay, so in summary for Cedar Fox, right, this is one approach, the document examiner is the one um, um, driving this, this analysis. We did something statistical, that's great, right? We're with that movement. It supports the examiner workflow. There are other functionalities of the software that let you ground truth things um, and, and you can search back for them as you move forward in your analysis. So it really does that well. Um, I usually use green check marks and red X's, um, but I didn't want to like red X anything out here, right? Because being document examiner driven is fine if that's what you want to use the software for. Okay, we're gonna try and fill that gap with a software that isn't necessarily document examiner driven in the sense that the document examiners are deriving the features, okay? But this is, this. none of these softwares are bad, right? They're all kind of in that movement toward um, statistical foundations. They're doing something statistical, it's maybe not just um, completely removing the subjectivity of the document examiner. Okay. Uh, the verbal scale conclusions, I thought, well, you're using likelihood. Why not give, you know, the likelihood and the, and the, um, the, the uncertainty and things like that. So, um, but, but the verbal scale conclusions are what I use in court. So, um, yeah. So um, I'm going to move on. So the approach number two, um, I call this one 2A because it is fully automated. It's a fully automated approach, so it's not document examiner driven. The features that are extracted are extracted automatically, um, but it's database based. Okay. So this is um, a, an analysis that's done on a closed set of writers. Okay. So you get a group of people and you're going to do your analysis and you say, okay, well, you, all you get to look at is the closed set of writers and you don't get to go outside of that set and, and, and consider another writer may have authored the document. So this is Flash ID developed at Gannon Technologies Group, now Scientrix LLC. Um, so it's a forensic language independent automated system for handwriting identification. What Flash ID does is it breaks the document into small meaningful pieces. They call these graphemes, sometimes letters, sometimes not. Um, they quantify these graphemes. They, qu they quantify the topology and geographical features. Um, and you know, they get their numbers. This is data. Measurements from these graphemes um, in the question document are compared to graphemes of the same type uh, for all documents in a reference database. So this is a screen grab I took this morning of the reference databases that I have in Flash ID. Um, the FBI um, houses their threat letter database here, which is a great application for them, right? Because people who are writing threat letters, they can come in and kind of cluster these question documents with these people they already know are writing threat letters. Um, Often you won't have this many reference sets, right? You want to big one, build one big database, um, but but this is this is what Flash ID does. So then they do their statistical analysis using these measurements from the graphemes, and they give you results. So this top part here is the results that pop up. So you can see this W two. I've got a toy data set. Um, it's writer number two, and so it gives you the top four writers. This is the first thing you see, writer two, and then it thinks, oh, maybe your next most likely writer is writer five, and then writer one, and then writer four. And if you go into this this uh, this um, reference database collection that you can build, um, it gives these scores. And I was a little bit surprised to see these scores. Sometimes you see scores in upper 400s. Sometimes you see them negative 326, okay? So it's just a ranking, right, essentially. So we're ranking writers in a database, in a closed set, um, in order of likelihood. So this, in summary, right, we did something statistical that's great, good good movement toward the, 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 statist the statistical foundations. We did the automated feature extraction. That removes a bit of the, the inherent subjectivity of the, of the document examiner. 
we're giving quantitative conclusions. I don't know what the numbers mean, but at least they're numbers, I guess. Um, uh, but, but again, there, there are no um, uncertainty measurements here. Um, it's on a close set of writers, which is okay if that's what you're looking for. If you're the FBI and you need a threat letter database, this is good for you. Um, but, but it's expensive. So this system costs a lot of money. Um, it costs a lot of time and effort to create a database like this. So if, you, if it's going to be useful for you, you have to build a huge database to search every time you need to recognize a question document, right? So, um, so that's, that's Flash ID. So this is an automated approach, but still is on this close set of writers and it's expensive and it's database based. Okay, so this is where I come in, right? This emerging technology, this is what CSafe's been up to. So I call this 2B, because it's still automated, but now we're gonna work on an open set of writers. We're going to try and move from this closed set um, to, to an open set of writers. And so the features are still going to be generated kind of automatically in an automated way. Um, you can't ever remove all subjectivity because as, um, as the coder, I, I still have to tell the computer what to measure. The computer can decide what's important, what's discriminating, okay? But if I, don't, if, if I don't think to measure it, the computer has no idea that it's there. So turning these, this paper that's scanned in, right, with writing on it from black and white, um, or however, however it gets scanned in, Right? To numeric features, there still is just a slight subjectivity there with, with what are you going to measure. So our goal is to measure a bunch of things, right? Um, a ton of stuff, everything we can think of. There's a, um, there have been papers out there that, that are say, oh, here's how you can turn handwriting into data. Here's another way to turn handwriting into data, right? Lots of different ways to quantify this stuff. And so, um, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to use a lot of different ways to quantify handwriting. And we're going to let um, a, a learning algorithm, a supervised learning algorithm, like a random forest, um, decide and kind of tell us what was discriminating for that algorithm, for that system. Okay, because what document examiners look at, they've been looking at for years and years and years, and it's it's their it's their um, go-to, right? Sometimes it just gets engraved in their heads. They look for the ascenders and descenders and, and the curvature and it, these subtle things that go through their head, sometimes you can't communicate those. So we want to measure those things, curvature and, and you know, if, if the circle of the A is more round or oblong and how oblong is it and which way is it slanted and, and all these fine measurements and try and kind of get at what actually goes through that, that background process of a document examiner's head. So we're going to measure a bunch of stuff. Um, to quantify this. So, so our process, so, so what we're doing, what we've done so far, is we process a document, we, we break it up into small pieces, right? Small, meaningful, usable pieces. Um, these are similar to graphemes, but not, not, not the same. Um, we aren't right now learning what the words say, what the letters are. We're context independent at this point, which we find um, to be a strength. Uh, because we don't care if you misspelled the word or whatever it is. We just want to know the biometric curvature and slant and things of your handwriting, okay, when we quantify that, does it match the curvature and the slant and all these other things um, in, in this other document? Okay, so we're calling these, these smaller meaningful pieces that we break up graphs. Um, so we're going to group and label these graphs together based on the number of nodes and how those nodes are connected. Like, right. And so these, these two on the left here are what we call like a T shape, so you could bend and twist those and make those into a T. Um, the, one on, the one in the middle has a loop, so that's a node that's connected to itself. Uh, this one on the right has six nodes with, you know, with the, um, the double connection in the middle there. And so these are all kind of put into buckets. So if you look like the two on the left, you get put in their bucket. And so, but what this is doing here is we are, we're giving you uncertainty, okay? So I'll, I'll explain what this is. So, we're, so this is 2192. Right, so here's that 4112 we saw before. But this is the bucket 2192. So anything that looks like a 2192 gets put in that bucket. We count the number of those. We, we find the proportion of the writing that falls into that bucket. And we can kind of, we can, we can look at the uncertainty around that proportion. So these are posterior curves in our statistical analysis. And so what, what, we, what you're seeing is that um, let's see, so the writers are over here on your right. So for writer one, right, we have nine writers. For writer one, we see that it's centered around like 0 0.07. So the proportion of, of, gra of graphs that fell into that bucket, ooh, I don't know what I did. Oh, you can't see this. I think 
this is fine. Um, the proportion of graphs that fall into that bucket are around like 0.07, right? And so, but there's some uncertainty around that, right? It could be 0.09, it could be 0.05. And so we have this bell-shaped curve where it's most likely that the, the proportion of graphs that fall into that bucket for that writer is 0.07, right? But it, it could be something else. And you see curves that are really spiked and peaked. We've got a lot of, a lot of um, evidence that, right, this is where that proportion's at for those curves, for those buckets, for those riders. Um, and some of them are really flat and wide, like, riders fi like rider five. You see, all their curves are kind of flat. We didn't have a lot of writing for them. We didn't have a lot of graphs to put into buckets, so we're kind of uncertain about what's going on with rider five. Okay? Um, and so what we do here is we say, okay, well, let's look at a new document. Let's look at a question document. Right? So this is kind of a visual analysis. Right? This is all done numerically, kind of behind the scenes. Um, but, but what we can look at is say, all right, well, if we just had the bucket 2192, you can't tell much, right? But one feature is not that discriminating. You might be able to take a few good guesses. But what happens when we add the next bucket? I can't see what it is. Three something. Three, two, two, four. Right? Well, what, what was the proportion of graphs in our question document that fell into bucket 3224? Put that on there. You know, now you might have a little bit of a better idea. And as we add more and more features, more and more buckets to our analysis, um, we, actually, we can actually pick out visually, um, if you look for long enough, that these lines match up pretty, pretty nicely with writer 3's curves. Right? It's kind of hitting the top of a lot of them. It's a little off on some, but it's, it's matching it pretty nicely with Rider 3's curves, these bumps. And so this is kind of the visual, the visual version of, of this modeling. Um, but what we can see here is that, okay, well, how many of these buckets do we need for a good analysis? This is a question document that we know was authored by Rider 1. Question document that we know ground truth was authored by Rider 2, written by Rider 2, right? Rider 3 and so on. And what we can see is that the probability, these are the probabilities that our algorithm places on the true author, on the ground truth author. So with only four buckets included in, a, in the model, um, only 0 0.046 probability is placed on the true author for, for a question document that was authored by writer one. Not great. Okay, that means 0 0.096 of the probability was placed on other authors. Okay. Um, but for some, like up here where there are ones, for author six I think it is, um, right, it hits the nail on the head right away. Um, and so what we're trying to do with this is we're, gonna, we're trying to see how many buckets, how many, how many graph types do we need to include in our model um, moving forward, you know, kind of how much, how much is enough to be discriminating, and this is a toy, toy example and a closed data set, but these are the types of analyses we're doing right now in the early stages of the project. Um, in order to tell us, you know, what do we need to measure in the later stages when we move to an open set. So as you move through and add more and more buckets, you can see these lines are getting darker and darker and darker, and, and it, this x-axis isn't uniform. It jumps from 12 to 15 to 20 to 25. But as you move forward, we're, these, these bars are getting darker, and, and we're doing a really good job of discriminating in a closed set of writers. So that's what we're up to now. So next, what we want to do is we want to identify this, you know, we want to, we want to figure out which features are important for analysis, you know, which ones should we measure, which ones should we tell the computer to measure. And we want to use a statistical supervised learning algorithm to identify the discriminatory features and combine these features into a single similarity score for a pair of documents. And so this is my ideal curve, right? Um, you saw with Alicia's talk that these you know, they, they overlap and they're not, they're not the same height and these curves don't, don't match up always like this. But, but this is ideal, right? Not much overlap, really separated curves for, 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 for similarity scores for mated pairs, right? These would have high scores. Scores for non-mated pairs, ground truth non-mated pairs would have low scores. So we're moving toward this score. Um, we call these reference distributions, right? And so the idea is that if you consider a new pair of documents and you run them through the algorithm, you get a score, let's say it's 80, you can say, all right, well, here's where the score falls on the curve. Here's our uncertainty around the score. Here's how likely it is that they're mated. Here's how likely it is that they're non-mated documents. And, and you can give uncertainty estimates and move from there. So that's, that's where we're going, but we're in the early stages. Um, so the summary of, of, of ours is, um, we've got these statistical foundations that we're meeting on this parametric modeling and, and uncertainty that we can measure. 
um, we are reaching quantitative conclusions, we're reaching toward them. We're going to report uncertainty measures and error rates. Um, we've got the automated feature extraction, which removes a little bit of the inherent um, examiner bias. Uh, we're moving to an open set of writers, right? You get a pair of documents. I don't care who else is in the world. I just care about the similarity between these two documents. Um, and we're going to make our algorithm open source and, and, and like everything at CSAFE. Um, you know, I always think, so an examiner gets on the stand and they say, but trust me, I have 40 years of experience. Okay, but if you hide your code and you hide your applications and you hide all this stuff, what is so different about saying, I'm a coder, trust me, I have coding experience. Here's my model, here's my algorithm, right? So I, I really like that CSAFE has this kind of open source um, um, idea. So uh, open source, repeatable methodology moving forward. So I just want to bring it back to this case study. I'm wrapping up here. Um, so special agents got this crash course on handwriting. They went out and examined almost two million handwriting records. What if we could run all of these pairs of handwriting records, you know, ransom note, DMV record, DMV record, pairs, run this through an algorithm, get similarity scores to pop up on a computer, right, and say, hey, these documents had really similar handwriting, maybe we should check these people out, okay? This would save tons of time, I know this was in the 50s, right? But it's a good kind of idea of where we're trying to go with this. So um, maybe it wouldn't take over a month to do, to do something like this um, and, and, and work through an open set of writers and, and see how similar the documents are to a, a ransom note, let's say. Um, yeah, pairs of documents, how similar are they? So that's all I have for you. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Yes. Can you go back to the slide that has all the blue boxes and the various characteristics? Had the what? The blue boxes. The blue boxes. These? That very mm -hmm. So what happened there on the far? Yes. Here? I don't know. <laughs> so um, it's. Since we're on a closed set of writers, um, the five that were added from here to here, you know, these curves have, they have spread to them. So if this question document starts kind of hitting, hitting, you know, partway on some other curves, a little bit of probability is going to be taken from the true author. Um, and so, and so this is, the, I mean, this is just, this is just number of graphs in the bucket, right? So this is our, our, our coarsest level of data. What we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to measure the loops and we're going to measure the curves and we're going to measure the distances and we're going to measure all of these, these finer measurements. Um, and so that's where we start to really start to see the discriminating power. So, um, so I can't tell you for sure what happened with, with this, this toy set. Um, it's a close set, and so those bumps, and depending on their variabilities and how flat they are and things like that, um, when you get up until we get more buckets. The other thing, too, is, is um, I think like 60% of graphs, something ridiculous, falls in like three buckets. So um, once you get out into like 40 buckets, you have kind of sparse data. You, you don't have a lot of counts falling into those buckets, and so weird things can start to happen. So we really are, are ready to move into the fine grain measurements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I imagine that the availability of handwriting samples will continue to diminish with technology. So where does that, where does that lead you? Yeah, so I was going to put a slide in about this. Um, I always get this question, you know, why are you joining a dying field? Um, <laughs> okay. um, I, I do a lot of outreach with CSA for middle school and high school students, so they have a little bit less, um, yeah. Um, but but they, they always ask that question. Don't you just text or something? Like, wouldn't you just, wouldn't you just show the bank teller your phone and be like, put all the money in the, you know, in the bag? And I'm like, oh, well, I don't, I don't rob banks, but I don't know. Um, but, but, you know, I asked Gary this question because I kept getting the question, you know, why are you joining a dying field? Isn't everybody just going to type everything? And he said, as long as somebody is writing something down and doing something illegal with it, you know, somebody has to know how 
to analyze it. You know, as long as people are writing threat letters, the FBI is going to keep a threat letter database um, and, and, and things like that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, but that's, that's what Gary says, and I, I like Gary. So, um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so, I mean, he's a document examiner, so people ask him that all the time. But as, as, long, as, as long as people are writing things down, we, we need these tools um, because, because it's going to be, you know, they still train document examiners, as far as I know, on typewriter. Um, typewriter, there are different types of typewriters and things like that. And so they still train them on, the, on, those, um, on those analyses because people still type things on typewriters to try and, you know, it's the kind of the idea of like, oh, I'm going to cut out things from magazines and make a threatening note out of them. But with typewriters, right, they won't be able to trace a typewriter. So they still train on that because people still do it. All right. Well, it's near the end of the day. So there's uh, one thing I want to mention is we're probably going to go a little bit over 5 p.m. I'll try to keep mine short. Um, if anyone leaves right at 5 p.m., I will give you the evil eye. So please stay for our, our last presenter as well. Um, as Alicia mentioned earlier, my name is Henry Swafford. I am the chief of the latent print branch at the, UN, at the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Laboratory. And in that capacity, I'm responsible for latent print examinations that are performed in support of the criminal investigative mission for the Department of Defense. I also serve as the chair of the Friction Ridge Subcommittee for the uh, OSAC. And that subcommittee is responsible for developing best practice and guidelines and standards governing how Friction Ridge examination will be performed by laboratories across the country. Now, I share that information not because I'm pompous, but because there's a, a federal regulation for everything, 5 CFR 2635.807. There's a federal regulation for this. I'm actually here on my own time, not actually as a representative of the government. It's just that I believe that it's important to continue these types of conversations. So with that being said, there's one more obligatory thing I need to say, that this presentation is my own personal views and opinions. It is not necessarily official or representative of the views and opinions of the Department of Defense, Department of the Army, Department of Commerce, NIST, OSAC, or anyone else that I may be affiliated with. So having said that, um, I think the previous presentations have set this one up very well, that at this point you know there's been um, increasing criticism that has been facing the forensic science community, in particular the pattern evidence domain, such as fingerprints, firearms, footwear, um, handwriting, and so forth. And these have translated into calls for reform, calls for reform that have been dialed to our numbers not just once, not just twice, not even three times, but four times. Four times we have been faced since 2009 with these calls for reform in the forensic science community and in particular pattern evidence domains with a lot of particular reference to fingerprints. Not that they're the worst, but because they're one of the most widely utilized techniques across nearly every crime laboratory around the, uh, around the world for that matter. And these are not ref calls for reform by just Joe Schmo academic. These are calls for reform by reputable scientific organizations, so we have got to listen to them, in my opinion. And there's, although they, they have different recommendations, they all, they have one issue that transcends every one of those. And it's this issue that the pattern evidence is, uh, the significance of the pattern evidence domains rely solely on the subjective interpretation of the human analyst. And I would describe that with this slide here, that the human analyst serves as a central point of the entire process. He or she will serve as the instrument of detection of the feature attributes that may be in the impressions. Now, that's not so bad in and of itself, in my opinion. But it gets a little bit complicated when that same analyst goes a step further and serves as the instrument of measurement. And the twist here is that we don't actually take tangible physical measurements. And then it gets a little more complicated when we take it a step further and we serve as the instrument of evaluation, where we evaluate the significance of the measurements we never really took against criteria that doesn't exist to substantiate a conclusion. Now, that does not mean that fingerprint analysts or any other pattern evidence domain, the analysts are incorrect, but it sure doesn't sound good, in my opinion. <laughs> What has been proposed is to encourage the pattern evidence domains or the forensic science community in general to move towards this model. And you've had a lot of exposure to that with the prior presentations, where maybe the human analyst still serves as the instrument of detection. Not perfect, but um, 
not unacceptable. But then what we need to strive towards is integrating some sort of tool that can take physical measurements regarding the attributes of the features that we've detected or the features that are present on the evidence samples. Measurements that I can point to, measurements that I can show to you, measurements that I can hand to you. None of this measurement stuff in my head. And then we need to take those physical, tangible measurements and go towards a ground truth data set, measurements that have been taken against, against samples where we know ground truth, the impressions originated from common sources, and we know ground truth, the impressions originated from different sources. And then we, we evaluate the measurement taken from this evidence sample for which I do not know ground truth, how does it correspond to the measurements taken against the data sets of samples which we do know ground truth? Is it more similar to the uh, measurements taken from common sources or more similar to different sources? That's the, where we need to be striving towards this particular model. Now what I'm gonna do is put this in a little bit of context of fingerprint examination and explain how the practice is done today and then talk of and then compare that against where we need to be moving forward to what I refer to as a future state of the science. And then talk a little bit about how we might get there and at the end, I have a treat for all the attorneys in here because I think we're gonna get here, get there with your help. So today, we have a two-step dance that I refer to for our methodology. Step one is the analyst will evaluate or analyze, as they refer to it, the qualitative and quantitative information available in the latent or unknown impression. It's a really complicated process. We look at it really closely, up and down and all around. And then we form an opinion regarding whether there's sufficient um, qualitative and quantitative information in this impression to substantiate or to allow us to move forward for a comparison. We form an opinion that the impression is suitable for comparison. Once I determine that the impression is suitable for comparison, I will move forward and actually perform the comparison. I'll get fingerprints from known individuals and what I'm looking for is similarity between my unknown impression and my known impression. So I add to my little dance, I go back and forth, I look at it up and down, I look at it all around. And finally I may find that a known source, an impression from a known source looks really, really, really similar to the impression that I don't know the source of. So I look at that and I'm looking for the similarities, I'm looking for any differences between the impressions that may lead me to believe they came from different sources. And at a certain point, I'm going to form the opinion that the impressions are essentially indistinguishable or the features correspond. And then I'm gonna go into the courtroom and I'm gonna testify that these two impressions came from common sources and I'm gonna look at each and every one of you and ask you to believe me ipsy dixit. That's the current state of our practice. Again, it doesn't mean that we're wrong, but it doesn't sound good when we talk about it in that manner and that's why we need to move forward. It's not because forensic sciences are plagued with errors left and right, it's just that we have some gaps that we need to uh, strengthen in our methodologies. The problems here is that I've alluded to earlier is that you have absolutely no knowledge of what I actually looked at in that impression. There was no measurements taken. There was no requirement for me to document anything. And you have no clue, I think someone asked it earlier, how much is enough? You have no clue for how much was enough for me to form that opinion. There are currently no standards for interpretation. As it was described to me during training courses within the last decade, you know it when you see it, you get that fuzzy feeling. And yes, I've served as a fingerprint practitioner, I'm still certified, and yes, I got the fuzzy feeling. I knew it when I saw it, but I couldn't explain it. And that's why I'm here trying to continue this type of conversation. So the question is, how do we get from point A, this current paradigm, to point B, where we integrate some sort of measurement tools? This is the very discussion that we're having in the OSACs, and it's taken quite a while for us to get stuff moving out of the OSACs, in my opinion, because when we've all come together, we've realized, oh no, we've got a little bit of a problem. We all disagree, and what is the best way to move forward? We all disagree with how much information is enough, and we disagree with how to measure it. 
So that's the struggle that we're going through now, is moving from point A to point B. In my opinion, how to, how to facilitate this transition, there's four tasks that we need to do. Number one, document the details utilized. Number two, measure the attributes of those features or those details. Evaluate the significance of those measurements and the context of ground truth data sets. And then, this is what I talked about on the panel earlier, report the conclusions which are substantiated by the data. Four tasks will allow us to transition from point A to point B where we need to go. And at this point, we'll talk about a practical solution. It may not be the best solution, but it sure is a better solution than the current state of the practice of things that fingerprint analysts can do because of new technology that has now recently been released. The first one I'm gonna talk about, and actually before I say this, let me say that any technology that I reference is not to be construed as an endorsement. It is simply used as an example of how laboratories can facilitate this trans, uh, transition. So one thing that the analyst can do is use a software program called LQ Metric. LQ Metric is freely available for US-based federal, state, and local government forensic science service providers. It's built within another software program called Universal Latent Workstation that is distributed by the FBI to these government entities. LQ Metric operates by taking the impression and analyzing very quickly, analyzing the clarity of the friction ridge detail and then color coding the different regions within the fingerprint image of high clarity, low clarity, and so forth. Clearly, if you have a high clarity region of a fingerprint, that means that any interpretation of a feature in the high clarity region, we can have more reliability of. Interpretation of features in a low clarity region, we might want to be more cautious about. So not only does it color code it for an end user um, uh, purposes, but it will also summarize the quality of the impression in a quantitative terms. Once we're able to summarize the quality of this impression in quantitative terms, that now allows us to evaluate how well analysts are performing when comparing fingerprint images at different levels of quality. And then we can codify that into our standard operating procedures. So now, not only are we solving the issue of measuring uh, attributes within the image, but number two, we're evaluating the significance of those measurements in the context of uh, ground truth data sets and codifying that with a standard criteria for a conclusion. So that solves the issue or provides a tool that fingerprint analysts today can incorporate into their methods that um, in terms of the analysis phase of their methodology. The second thing we'll talk about is once I've determine that a print is suitable, what's next? I have to compare it to a known source. Well, there's another software program that has um, recently been made available to US-based federal, state, and local government forensic science service providers. It was developed by our laboratory within the DOD, and we provide that free of charge. All they have to do is email us, and they'll get the whole software package and underlying materials. We refer to this program as FRSTAT. FR STAT stands for Friction Ridge Statistical Interpretation Software. And how it works is, once the analyst has formed their opinion that they think these two impressions have share similarities, and they've annotated the, the details they believe to correspond, so it is examiner-driven in that standpoint, rather than thinking that they correspond and then going to court and asking the court to believe them ipsy dixit, we'll then take this a step further and we'll run, the, system, run the, the, the paired impressions through FRSTAT software. FRSTAT will then um, measure the similarity between the two impressions based on the configuration of the features, summarize that similarity into a single similarity score, and then evaluate how often, or the context, what is the significance of that similarity score in the context of similarity scores derived from impressions for which we know came from the same source and for which we know came from different sources. And so what I'm gonna do is enlarge this graph a little bit so you can kind of see what I mean there. So for, this, for the comparison here, we've run that through the software and we get a similarity score of 54. That score in and of itself is pretty meaningless. We have to evaluate what that score means in the context of ground truth data sets. 
The score is represented by the blue line, which just coincidentally happens to fall right in the middle of the distribution of similarity scores for which we know impressions came from, the, from common sources. The distribution on the left is the distribution of the scores for which we know impressions came from randomly paired different sources. So just looking at the schematics of this graph, you know that the similarity score for that comparison is more in line with the similarity scores we might expect to observe among impressions coming from common sources versus different sources. Now quantitatively, we, can, we know that the proportion of the similarity scores from, that we know came from common sources that is less similar than this case at hand is about half, 0.49. And then the next question is, well, how often might we expect to see uh, a similarity score that's more similar than what we have for this case at hand among impressions we know that came from different sources? And that's the next value down. In this particular example, that proportion is, point, is estimated to be about 0 0.000005, or really small. And that's represented by the area under the curve for the left-hand distribution. It's actually shaded red, but you can't really see it. It doesn't uh, manifest itself in this graph. We've decided then we combine those two values together to produce a single probability ratio that we refer to as strength of evidence. But I know when you get a bunch of statisticians in the room, they're going to do their stuff and, and talk with each other, whether, whether they believe it truly is strength of evidence or not. So we call it a strength of evidence. And what we get in this particular example is um, a value of, calculated value of 96,425. Now how we would report that is represented here. Our report would state that the latent print on exhibit one and the standards bearing the name Swafford have corresponding ridge detail. The probability of observing this amount of correspondence is approximately 96,000 times greater when impressions are made from the same source versus different sources. And then we know that some people have trouble understanding what does that 96,000 actually mean, so we provide some context to that by saying anything with a ratio or results equal to or greater than 10 indicate what we classify as a positive association between two impressions or essentially a match being careful to note that a match or a positive association is not the same as a positive identification or individualization as the, as the field is using it. We will not go to court and say that this and these two impressions did originate from the same source. We go to court and we, provide, and we say there's a lot of evidence to support that the observations have more support for the proposition they came from the same source rather than different sources. And then we tie that ratio of 10 back to validation data sets where we know empirically observed uh, error rate information. Now, it's easy to stand in front of you and talk about what the field should do. And I, I, I understand that it's more difficult to actually implement that. But here in this particular presentation, um, this is, uh, this is one element where the field will not be able to say the technology is not yet there. That laboratories can implement these procedures if they want to. And that's where I think your help comes in as um, attorneys. Laboratories are able to access the latent print quality software, especially if they're um, able to receive it from the FBI according to FBI restrictions on distribution. But I, from my understanding, I believe it's open to freely open, freely available for federal, state, and local government entities. Laboratories are able to access the software developed by the Defense Department. As long as you're a US-based federal, state, or local government entity, you can have it free of charge, and we'll do everything we can to support your use of it. And then laboratories, most importantly, are able to ensure that their testimony is aligned with what the data supports and not an overstatement of that. These have been contentious topics in our field, or especially fingerprints, over the last couple of years. And I know that laboratories are able to do this because we've been doing it for over a year now. Over in March of 2017, we released our information paper to our, to our investigators and our JAG attorneys and said, you're going to see a little bit of a change on our reports, and this is what you're going to start seeing. And we've had no real issues with that, or, or, or they haven't been coming back to us yet. So with that being said, the last slide here, um, I've also come to realize over the last year 
that the forensic science community, laboratory leadership, should be the ones bearing the burden for forensic science reform. However, I'm a pragmatist now, and I don't believe that we're, to, we're going to totally bear that burden without litigation. So, whomever of you in this room are defense attorneys, I, I, I encourage you on your next case dealing with pattern evidence to ask the expert four questions. They're very simple questions. They're questions that we should be able to answer, but I bet you're gonna be surprised at the result. Question number one, ask the expert what was observed on the evidence samples. Question number two, ask them how it was measured. Ask them to show you the measurements. Question number three, ask them, we believe that it's significant, but why is it significant? Can you show me the data sets that you utilize to determine that the measurement taken is actually significant? And then number four, most importantly, ask them where is the data to substantiate the conclusion? In terms of the Friction Ridge Subcommittee for the OSAC, these are the four questions that I told them. I don't care how you get to it, but these are the four questions that we need to be able to answer for our field. And so these are the challenges that we're grappling with. And I encourage you again, the next time you litigate evidence, ask the expert these four questions, and I bet you're gonna be surprised by your result. I hope that, um, or I believe, I'm gonna rephrase that. I know that the only way for forensic science reform is a concerted effort between litigators and the forensic science leadership. I don't think one will change by itself. Um, so thank you all for your time. I, in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll, maybe I'll take one or maybe two quick questions and then I wanna transfer this over. Um, here's my contact information, so please feel free to email me. Don't call me, I hate the phone. It may take a week to call you back. <laughs> But, you know, if you email me, I'm pretty quick on that. All right, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you all for staying till the end. I know we're running kind of late, but given that we've heard all of the previous talks, I should be able to go pretty quickly. Um, so I'm a PhD student in statistics at Carnegie Mellon. I'm gonna be talking about an automatic method to compare uh, cartridge cases. So very similar to what Alicia was talking about previously, but for cartridge cases instead of bullets. Um, this is work with my advisor, Bill Eddy, um, one of the co-directors of CSAFE. So I'll just start by talking about the, a little bit about the current system um, and some problems with it, and then uh, some ideas about what the future might look like and some of the research that we've been doing at CSAFE um, to try to move things in that direction. So um, just to give a brief um, background, um, in firearms analysis, as you all know, um, the assumption is that uh, firing a gun leaves, uh, in, uh, leaves distinguishable, distinguishable marks on bullets and cartridge cases. Um, this helps to uh, identify the re retrieved cartridge cases to uh, a, suspect's gu a suspect's gun, or uh, uh, if we want to compare the evidence to, to a database, this helps to uh, generate investigative leads by, compare, uh, by combining evidence from d different crime scenes. So I'm just gonna talk about the two ways that uh, evidence is, uh, retrieved evidence is being compared. So the first is um, when uh, the retrieved cartridge cases are, co are compared to a database. So the ATF maintains a database of uh, images collected from crime scenes known as NIBIN. Um, so when an examiner uh, uh, has a retrieved cartridge, ca cartridge case, they can enter it into this database um, and perform a one-to-end comparison. Um, the question of interest in this case is, is the crime scene cartridge case from the same gun as any of the images in the database? And if matches are found in this case, um, evidence from these different crime scenes can be combined and this helps to generate investigative leads. So um, the algorithm that this system used is proprietary. Um, what it does is to return a, a list of top ranked potential matches as well as some scores, but there's no uh, meaningful interpretation uh, to these scores, so for example, a score of 200, nobody has any idea what this means. We know that it's higher than 100, but it's not twice as high or, or anything like that. So if examiners testify about the use of NIBIN, they would describe this as a search tool um, and nothing more. Um, if they make a, a determination of a match or a non-match, this would be based on their own uh, training and experience, um, which leads me to the second type of comparison where a uh, 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 crime scene cartridge case is compared directly to uh, a specific sample. So this specific sample might be from a top NIBIN search result. Um, what the examiner would do is to retrieve the physical cartridge cases for uh, closer, closer examination. 
Um, the cartridge case could also come from a suspected source. For example, if a firearm is uh, 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 collected from the crime scene together with a cartridge case, they might test fire the firearm to see if uh, the two have uh, the cartridge case came from the firearm. Or uh, if they have a suspect in custody and the suspect happens to own a, a firearm, they could also test fire this firearm to uh, answer the same question. So in all of these circumstances, the question of interest is the same. Uh, is the crime scene cartridge case from the same gun as some specific sample? And if um, examiners determine um, a match in this case, um, it could be used as court testimony and might uh, implicate a suspect. Um, so this comparison is done by examiners using a comparison microscope based on their experience and training. Um, the, the, since this is a subjective opinion, it might not be replicable. For example, if uh, examiners are given um, di uh, different information about the case, there could be contextual bias. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. Um, so there's some areas of improvement that can be made to the current system. First of all, as I mentioned, the one-to-end comparison is proprietary. So um, we don't know uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the system. Um, some earlier studies um, have shown that there have been high miss rates, meaning that the top ranked potential matches don't actually include the true um, matches, but we are not able to properly determine when the method succeeds, when it fails because of the proprietary nature. Um, also, as I said, the one-to-one -one comparison is subjective. It's not necessarily um, replicable. Um, so under these circumstances, it's difficult for courts to determine the reliability or accuracy of the conclusions. Um, as you all know, the 2016 PCAST report made um, two specific recommendations about firearms analysis. The first is to improve it as a subjective method by, for example, conducting more rigorous pro proficiency testing for examiners. Um, the second point was to convert firearms analysis from a subjective method to an objective method, and this is what I'm going to be uh, focusing on. So depending on the success of these um, automatic automated methods um, in the future, um, uh, they might be used by examiners and in courts. And this is an example of, uh, of what testimony could look like. So um, uh, the examiner could first start by saying something like, based on my experience and training, these two cartridge cases come from the same gun. Um, to my knowledge, this is typical testimony under the current system. Um, then what an uh, algorithm can uh, 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 come up with is two measures that could be useful. The first is a similarity score, and the second is a measure of weight of evidence. So this second statement up here, um, this pair also had a similar similarity score of 0.9, the highest score returned by some algorithm among some subset. So this similarity score of 0.9 should have some um, meaningful interpretation. For example, it could be a correlation. Um, this second statement also serves as a means of blind verification. What this means is, so the examiner would do uh, uh, their analysis as per uh, normal, and then they could take all of the samples and run it through this um, automatic uh, algorithm. Uh, hopefully, the results from the automatic algorithm would corroborate their findings, and then they could make a statement like this. Um, the third sentence is, if the two cartridge cases are not a match, the probability of observing a higher similarity similarity scores uh, than, say, 0.9 is some uh, percentage. Hopefully, it's a small percentage. Um, this serves as a measure of the weight of evidence and could help jurors uh, make decisions. So this is related to, like, to the likelihood ratios that you've all been hearing about. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this uh, in a second. So I'll just uh, briefly talk about our broad uh, research goals. So um, we're trying to come up with a comparison method with um, the following properties. So first, we would like it to be open source. Um, as I mentioned, there's problems uh, uh, with the current uh, NIBIN system um, uh, because of its proprietary nature. So we would like everything to be fully transparent so that anybody who is interested can look at the code, uh, uh, verify that the results are indeed what is being reported, and so forth. Um, the second point is, as much as possible, we would like uh, methods to be automatic to um, uh, uh, minimize any subjectivity and make sure that results are replicable. Uh, the third point is we would like methods to be scalable. So I talked about the one-to-n comparison earlier. N could be very large, for example, uh, 10,000 or 50,000 or something, and we would hope that any kind of autom automated method that we come up with is uh, able to work with such a large number of comparisons. 
Um, and the last point, of course, is uh, it should produce a measure of the weight of evidence. Um, so uh, at a high level, this is what an autom uh, uh, the automated algorithm that we've developed. Uh, 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 these are the steps in, in the automated algorithm. So first, we have to pre-process the images to uh, get them ready for comparison. And then we have to align, uh, when we have pairs of images, we want to align them properly before coming up with the two measures that we're interested in. So I'll go into uh, more details about each of these steps. So um, for the pre-processing, um, the steps that we've come up with are in the box there on the left. Um, I won't go over them individually, but broadly, um, the objectives are to first um, select the re uh, relevant areas for comparison. So what this means is, so in the work that we've, do, we've been doing, we're focusing on the breach face marks uh, and not the firing pin impression. So what we do is to remove the firing pin impression to focus on uh, the breach face marks. Um, then we remove any unwanted effects due to the imaging process. Um, so the imaging process might introduce um, um, effects due to, say, differences in brightness, or there might be outliers or missing values. Um, uh, in the measurement process, so uh, this helps to take care of that. And finally, we want to highlight certain features, so this could correspond to the individual features as opposed to um, class characteristics. So after pre-processing, this is an example pair of images. Um, so you can see that there's some marks that are pretty nicely highlighted, so there's striations, and also you can see some uh, ridges and valleys. Um, but you might notice that in these two images, the marks are not properly lined up. So on the left image, the, hor the striations are uh, mostly horizontal, whereas on the right image, they're angled upwards. So before, if we just compute some kind of similarity uh, score based on these two images, it might not actually be very large just because it's not properly lined up. So what we want to do is to find um, the best possible uh, rotation and translation parameters um, so that these two images uh, align properly. So there's one rotation parameter um, and translations we consider horizontal and vertical. So there's three parameters in total that we need to estimate before we can um, uh, as, uh, compute a similarity measure. So um, uh, we've, we've tried two methods so far. Um, what I call a fast method and um, a precise method. So I'll first talk about the fast method. So um, in the fast method, we first downsample the images um, to one-tenth of the resolution in each dimension. So for example, if we have images that are 500 by 500, um, we downsample them to 50 by 50 just to make everything much quicker. Um, and then we use what's called the lucas Canadi algorithm. So this is um, used in computer vision uh, uh, tasks for um, image tracking. So for example, if you want to track, say, a car through video frames, you could use this. Um, you could also use it for uh, alignment, which is what we're doing. So what we do is to minimize mean square error. I'll just talk briefly about what, what these mean. So um, mean square error is just the, uh, so we take two images, we compute the difference between um, the values in each pixel, we square them and sum them. That's basically what the mean squared error is. Um, if the two images are more similar, then we would expect the mean squared error to be smaller, and if they're uh, different, then the mean squared error should, uh, would be higher. So what we want to do is to find the values of the rotation and translation parameters that would minimize this mean squared error, so meaning that the two images are properly aligned. Um, to do this, we use what's called um, gradient descent, so I'm just doing a very simple example here. If you have a curve that looks like this and you want to find the, a, a value on the x-axis, so on the horizontal axis, to minimize this function. So this function has a local minimum, which is on the left, and a global minimum on the right. So what gradient descent does is we choose some random starting value. So, so you can think of this function as the mean square error. So we want to minimize it uh, uh, over the horizontal axis. So we find, uh, we start with some starting value and we compute the gradient at that point, and then we move in the direction of negative of the gradient. So at that, say we start there and we get the, a gradient that's negative, negative of this negative gradient is positive, <laughs> which means that we should move in the positive x direction. So move to the right, and that will take us to the local minimum. So that, in essence, is what this algorithm is doing to, uh, to find the best 
rotation and translation parameters. So if you notice, if you start on there, on the point on the left, you would get a local minimum, whereas if you started somewhere on the right, you would get to the global minimum, which is why this, is, this method is fast and approximate. So um, it takes about 0.03 seconds per pair to align, um, which is uh, very fast compared to the next thing that I'm gonna talk about. So the next alignment method is what I call the precise method. So um, now we want to uh, maximize a different measure. So this is, uh, uh, we are trying to maximize the correlation and now we want to find the global a, a global solution which would take much longer. So um, what a correlation is, is a, it's also a similarity between uh, uh, two variables. So it ranges from uh, negative to one, uh, sorry, negative one to one, one being uh, perfect positive linear relationships. So I just pulled this, these examples off Wikipedia. Um, basically, we're trying to find the correlation between the variable on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis. So if all of the points fall on a straight line with a positive gradient, then the correlation is one, meaning that they're extremely similar. So um, if we talk about images instead of just uh, instead of just X and Y variables, what we do is to take all of the pixel values from one image, we plot it on the horizontal axis, and then the corresponding pixels from the second image, we plot them on the vertical axis. So that will give us something that could possibly look like one of these on top, and then we can compute the correlation value. So again, one means similar, closer to zero means um, no relationship. So I put the formula, formula up in case people are interested. Um, so what we do is to uh, try to maximize this correlation uh, using a brute force search, meaning we just try all of the possible values of the rotation and translation parameters. So um, uh, this, this turns out to be much slower, so it takes three to four seconds to align a pair of images, which is almost 100 times longer than the previous method that I was talking about. But um, of course we would get more accurate results. So, um, uh, so after we've aligned the images, we can compute a measure of similarity, and you've seen a lot of these types of graphs, so I don't have to explain uh, what they are. Uh, but basically, we do see that there is, so the fast methods on the left, the precise methods on the right, and we do see that in both this situ, uh, in using both these methods, there's uh, uh, an overlap between the two distributions, meaning that uh, the, this is unable to perfectly separate the non-matching pairs from the matching pairs. And this data set is uh, taken from NIST, so we're using a total of over 800 images and we do all of the pairwise comparisons, so it's, we're plotting uh, over 300,000 uh, pairs in this uh, figure. So we tried to look at the results a little bit more closely. So now instead of using two separate plots, I have the FAST method on the horizontal axis and the corresponding scores from the precise method on the vertical axis. So if the two methods were perfectly equivalent, we would just see a linear relationship, so we would see a 45 degree line. But now we do see that the precise method has worse results than the fast method. In particular, um, the green points, there are green points above the diagonal. So what this means is say we look at a point um, like this, somewhere around here. So the FAST method gives a correlation of zero, whereas the precise method gives a correlation of 0.8. So since this is a matching pair, we would, we would expect the, we would like the correlation to be high. So the points, any green points above the diagonal suggest that the, uh, the precise method is doing much better than the FAST method. So um, this is for the entire NIST database of 800 images. Um, they're broken down into various studies. So one study, uh, so the studies are uh, conducted by different uh, groups in the firearms and too much co uh, community. So for example, some group might only be interested in a particular firearm. So what we did next is to try and figure out uh, whether there's any differences in the results uh, for the various studies. And we did see that there's some studies where both methods have very comparable performance so if you look at these plots, there's not many green dots above the diagonal. Um, whereas there's some where there's a lot of green dots above the diagonal. And uh, uh, it seems like 
the studies involved, involving Ruger firearms tend to do, uh, the, the precise method tends to do much better than the fast method. So we don't really know why this is the case at the moment and um, we need to look into this uh, further. So finally, I'll just talk a little bit about likelihood ratios. Um, I'll just go over it pretty quickly since lots of people have talked about it and there's another session tomorrow. Um, but basically, this is the, uh, the formula for likelihood ratio. We want to know the probability of uh, observing the evidence given that the pair is a match over the probability uh, of observing the, the evidence if the pair is a non-match. And then the, this is the interpretation of the likelihood ratio. Henry just mentioned it, so I won't go over it again. So I'm just going to talk about uh, how this thing that I, this method that I just described can be used to compute the denominator of the likelihood ratio, which is known as the random match probability. So the interpretation of the random match probability is, say we get uh, the random match probability is 0.01%. Uh, in words, we can say if the suspect was not the source, the probability of observing the evidence is 0.01%. Uh, and um, so we want to compute the probability of uh, observing the evidence given that the pair is a non-match. And um, in the case of, say, DNA, um, we have generative models for computing this. So we, uh, we know the probability of observing uh, the same DNA information in however many locations given that the DNA samples are actually coming from two different people. Um, but in the case of cartridge cases, we don't know the, the data generating mechanism for uh, observing these marks. So instead, we're using a score-based approach. Uh, so say for a particular comparison of interest, we got a, a score X, say X is 0.9. So what we want to do is find the probability of observing a score bigger than 0.9 given that the pair is a non-match. So if we had some uh, theoretical distribution of uh, non-matching scores, we can just take the right tail probability. Um, Henry talked about this. Uh, so since we don't have such a theoretical distribution, we might think about find, uh, just using an empirical distribution based on some uh, reference database that we might have. So for example, we take this database, find all of the uh, scores from the non-matching pairs, and then that might be this yellow distribution, and then we take the right tail probability. So this is a pretty straightforward way that we can um, generate the the random match probability using uh, the method that I just described. So um, I'll just end by talking about some of the issues that we still have to deal with. Um, so uh, uh, the first point is about how to operationalize these two methods, these two alignment methods that I talked about. So the fast method and the precise method. Um, we might, if we have a very large database, say like tens of thousands, we might first want to use the FAST method and then from uh, the top results of the FAST method maybe take some subset like 100 or 200 or something and then do the uh, precise method for that small number of candidate matches. Um, we need to figure out what percentage is suitable uh, and uh, various other issues. Uh, so the second point is we use a resolution of uh, one-tenth of the original resolution for the FAST method. Um, there's no reason to suggest that one-tenth might be the best. It could be one-twentieth, one-fiftieth, and so forth. Um, we would still need to uh, do some uh, experiment uh, uh, experimentation to figure out what the right resolution is. Uh, the third point is related to uh, the, the plots that I showed on the various data sets. So um, as I said, it seemed like the Rugers tend to do more poorly uh, using the, 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 the FAST method, and we don't know why yet. Um, the fourth point is um, uh, we might want to think about other ways to speed up the comparisons if we have a very large database. For example, we might cluster the database into uh, clusters that are more similar to each other. So if we have a retrieved cartridge case, we might only be able to compare it to one of the clusters in the database as opposed to the entire database. So this is another uh, issue that we might look into. And the last point is related, related to the construction of the empirical distribution that I was talking about for the weight of evidence. Um, uh, we don't know exactly which non-matching pairs should be included in, in, in that empirical distribution. Um, so that's all I have. 
uh, that's my email, and I put up uh, some of our earlier work was in uh, published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences. I just put up the reference in case people are interested, and I'll take any questions. Yeah, I have no idea how many samples are in the Is it millions? Um, it's millions. Yeah. But typically, they wouldn't do a search on the million. They would take like uh, uh, they would take a subset based on the geographical location or shape of iron pin impression type of, uh, like it was it a homicide. So they don't actually search against the, the million observations. Okay, thank you.